yeah, let's let's get this show on the road. So yeah, welcome back to another episode. I'm sorry it took us this long, but um, as I mentioned to most of you all who were in the group chat, the student chat in particular, it takes a long time to put together all of this stuff. I just told those guys I'm running on three hours of sleep and a pack of red mango for the foreigners out there as a pack of preserved fruits. Um, we have a lot of people. Thank, thanks for registering, by the way. We had, last I checked, the headcount was, I think, 186 persons registered. Um, you will be given your certificates of attendance um, at the end. I think within about 48 hours after, just check your spam and you should have it there. Um, we have a pretty interesting lineup for you all today. It is a lot of information. Um, there's a handout section. If you look somewhere on the side of your screen, you may see the chat button, the handouts button. I did put the slides there. Uh, for those of you all using mobile devices, if you can't access the slides and the handouts and so on, um, just shoot me an email afterwards and I'll send it to you, right? I'll, I'll probably upload it to a link. This will also be up on YouTube. And what I do is that I usually timestamp everything. So it's a, it's a long webinar. It's about two hours um, at least, right? Sometimes we go a bit over. You'll free to leave when you want. Um, if you have to leave, just leave it to run till the end. So that way you'll automatically be sent your certificate. We don't have anything to do with the certificates. Go to webinar actually sends you the certificate automatically. Um, so yeah, just check your spam and leave it running. You will get your certificates, All right? So um, I wanted to put together this on uh, um, ransomware for a very, very long time, right? Because that's the, pretty much the, the trending threat that we have these days. I wouldn't even say it's a threat, it's more like a nightmare um, when you think about it. And when I show you all the different types of ransomware that you have out there, it, it is pretty scary, right? Um, feel free to use the, um, the, the, the chats and the questions and stuff like that. Um, it's fine, right? We, we will try to look across on the screens every now and then and see what's uh, going on. Hey, there's Alex, all right, a wild Alex appears. <clears throat> Sorry for being late. Whew. Yeah, you're fired. All right, just kidding. <laughs> Bye, All right. You are fired. Let me um, let me start sharing the screen again. Um, yeah, you guys just let me know if you can see the the purple CF purple and black CFSI logo, and we'll get the show on the road. Awesome. All right, so yeah, our CFSI. Cyberfence webinar series brought to you by us, sponsored by us, right? Computer Forensics and Security Institutes. Um, we don't really look for sponsors because we just like being ourselves. We don't want to have to conform to anyone else and, and, and have behavior on this series, right? Hence, um, Joel is dressed quite nicely in what appears to be a kimono. I'm not sure. Look very pretty today, Joel. So, <clears throat> <laughs> All right, so this is our eighth episode and installment. Um, today's talk is about ransomware, different types of ransomware, the attacks, analysis, mitigation, and business continuity. This episode actually is a very special one, especially to me in particular, right? Um, because the 19th, which is tomorrow, would actually be one year since we started this project um, and sometime in August last year, yeah. So it's, for those of you all that don't know, I, I started this project sort of as a way to, to kind of honor my dad because um, he passed away last year in June and he was always helping people. He was, all, he was a teacher and he was a great teacher. He was my best friend. And he was always helping people and, and trying to do things to give back. So this was my way of sort of kind of like honoring his memory and stuff. So thank you very much because I know a lot of you all are returning. Um, participants and attendees so it's great to have you all here I, I still can't believe that 185 people registered for this that's that's yep. awesome i think right now we have maybe at least 100 people uh already and it just begun all oh, right so, say that again joe over 100 oh okay um yeah so this like all the other episodes it will be uploaded to our cfsi cyberfence youtube channel right just go to youtube Search for CFSI Cyberfence and you could subscribe there. I should have everything uploaded by next week. Um, the reason why not sooner is because I usually timestamp all of these because it's two hours long, each one of them. Um, I don't want everybody to just have to sit through two hours. So what I do is I, I timestamp them. So in the description for each video, you will see exactly what was talked about at what point in time and you could just skip to those parts as well, right? So yeah. 
just head over to YouTube, give us a like, and um, yeah, subscribe. guys, especially yeah, subscribe if you want. It's cool. Hit that notification um, also... bell. Whatever, whatever the YouTubers say. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll yeah. also put a link on social media and LinkedIn and chats and what have you. All right, and um, if you if you don't uh, see the link for it and you want it, just message me or, or email me. I'll put up my contact there uh, in a bit. You'll see it at the end again too. Right, feel free in the meantime um, to download the these all the slides and the handouts as I mentioned before. Um, if if not, that's okay. I'll make sure that I put up a link where you can just email me for the slides and I'll send it to you. I'll probably try to post them up on um, LinkedIn and stuff as well. So yeah, to these guys in particular, guys, I don't have a drink in my hand, but cheers to you. Thank you very much for helping me um, maintain this and being a part of this. All right, someone has Modelo show off. He didn't stingy, we didn't. Was a sponsor, but no. He didn't tell nobody he gonna pop it. Look, just one half was up. Cool. Right? Out, cool. <laughs> sanitizer today. Sanitizer. All right, so a little bit about us, apart from being uh, just a few regular guys in some. Um, interesting t-shirts out here, right? Um, Johnny, Johnny disappointed me. I was expecting expecting him to wear something a little different today. But <laughs> um, yeah, a little bit about us. Uh, we are all professionals in the field. A lot of you all might know that CFSI as a school where we teach a lot of cybersecurity, advanced um, cybersecurity, and networking and training and stuff. But this is what we do for a living. So there's a saying that those who can't do teach, well, we completely destroy that because we do. And we like teaching this stuff, which is why we teach it. All right. So we also offer vulnerability assessments, pen testing, incident response, forensics, um, information security awareness training, and we do a lot of cybersecurity consulting. So even if you work for a company, um, I know they have a lot of company uh, reps from companies and ministries, national security, ITAC. Um, I have a good bit of my foreign students here, Abby, Nikki, Chris, seeing you guys. Um, yeah, so if you if you want us to do some um, information security awareness training and talk about what well, actual real um, professional information security awareness training for for your department or your company, just let us know. It's free, right? We don't charge for this. This is this is our way of giving back uh, to you guys, all right? We have some idea of what we're talking about. We wrote a book on it, right? Um, I wrote two books on digital forensics with Kali Linux. Alex was the technical reviewer, and that book on assuring security by penetration testing. Alex was also an author of that book as well, right? These books were by Pact Publishing. You know them, um, pretty big um, tech publisher uh, throughout the world, right? Forgive me if I'm going a bit fast, but we have a lot of slides to go through because I was slightly ambitious in putting together um, all the content <laughs> for this. I, I was warned by Alex apparently, but like Alex says, nobody listens to him, so you know. Um, thank you very much to my clients out there. I really appreciate you guys. We have some huge clients out there as well, Fujitsu Caribbean, Unipet Maritime, uh, the Association of Trinidad and Tobago Insurance Companies, PRICT in Curacao, my good friend Donnie and Magdilis, and all those folks across there. We partner with them. We do a lot of work and training with them as well. Um, these are just some of the companies that we, we do work for routinely. Um, a lot of them, I can't put up their names due to non-disclosure agreements as well, right? But we do everything forensics pen testing vulnerability assessment consultancy you name it once what is once it involves cybersecurity we do it all right so just a, a little bit of background about us um hi my name is shiva i hack stuff with permission all right i'm the owner director pen tester forensic investigator lecturer author um we have my good friend alex there in the hacker jersey hacker jersey i guess all right alex is um one of the top senior pen testers in the Caribbean, I would say. He is also a really great lecturer. We have Mr. Deodat Fish Ganga. Um, he's a field network engineer and senior pen tester. He's a lecturer. He um, he he works at uh, Fujitsu as well, where I, I think um, he's very popular there. I know he really loves his boss there at Fujitsu as well. Just to, just to add to Shiva, Shiva is the leader of the CFSI army. Just turn that out there. Me? I, I know not of what you speak, sir. So. All hail. Then, um, All hail. Then we have this guy that looks like a serial killer. His name is Jonathan Marber in the white t-shirt there, right? <laughs> he's a senior pen tester lecturer, and he's also a fan of things that go... Um, Johnny, what, what was the noise? How does it go? How do you some, go? Some, some weird noise that Subarus make or engines make. Or I don't know. I think those could be the back up. <laughs> 
All right, then we have um, our networking folk, as I like to call him, Mr. Joel Gooding, there in what is apparently not a kimono, but a hoodie. It is a Star Wars jacket. I don't understand why. Oh, my bad, my bad. I, I didn't know. Okay, yeah. All right, cool. Yeah, Joel is a senior architect. He's a, a, a networking god, right? He's yeah. also a lecturer at CFSI. He's a vulnerability researcher. He's worked with me on some, some pretty big projects. Um, Joel has built ISPs. That's why I talk about him like that. And last but not least, and she's not here with us right now, but um, Savi, my wife Savi Parasha, the administrative manager and our official cake provider. And the reason why I dare when I get fat on weekends because she makes a lot of cheesecake cake. and stuff. So. Cake. Hi, Savi. More cake, please. Right. So let's jump into it, right? These are some of the topics that you all came here to see, right? Ransomware, statistics, types um ttps which we look at iocs as well ttps are pretty interesting, pretty interesting. yeah it's, it's um the the tactics and the techniques and, and and everything that you would look for that are similar between types of ransomware um how they they gain entry what they use um what they use for exploitation how they go about so if you understand the ttps in particular of the different types of ransomware and you you, you narrow them down you can sort of get a better idea of what you have to do in general to protect yourself and your organization from ransomware, which is very difficult, by the way, and a bit scary, as you'll see, right? We have IOCs, which are indicators of compromise, right? So how would, how would we spot um, ransomware on the network, which is very difficult. Even Cisco sort of dropped the ball on that recently, right? I'm gonna show you all how very easy it is to access ransomware. I'm not gonna point you all to the sites because I don't want to go to jail, right? Um, wow. Yeah, this is how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Follow these yeah. directions. There was too pretty for jail. So, all right, we want to um, talk about exploitation. <laughs> Alex is going to carry you all through some phishing. But what we want to do is actually split up this webinar into two. So this webinar, we just want to go through all these topics here, more on the, the theoretical side of it. But the analysis tools, I want to do a follow-up webinar on this, which we could probably schedule for maybe the first week of September. Um, once these guys are available. And for that one, we want to show you all some some actual demos of, of how these things happen, maybe do um, a phishing attack, um, some open source investigation, some forensics, some exploitation, to actually show you all how easy it is for some of this to be carried out, right? And then finally, we want to end it off with some mitigation and pre preventative tips as well. All right, so we're going to jump straight into it um ransomware it is the scariest topic today within the digital world because once downloaded and planted within a system i mean it could encrypt just your data but it could also lock your entire system so those are pretty much the two main differing characteristics between the types of ransomware that we have and it encrypts everything sometimes it, it doesn't discriminate it will just encrypt everything some of them look for certain types of documents to encrypt those things and uh, the scary part of it is that some of them are actually hybrids, meaning that they are wormable and they also are combined with rootkits. For those of you all that don't know, a worm does not need user interaction. If you have a worm on a flash drive, you plug it into your machine on a network, it jumps from machine to machine to machine without any user interaction. So it's, it's pretty scary. And a rootkit is something that can be undetectable by your antivirus and firewall, intrusion protection system, intrusion detection systems, um so ransomware is becoming a, a complete nightmare for those of us in, in cybersecurity. and even you know it doesn't just have to be in, in a network environment it could be in your home environment as well because think about the photos that you probably have of your friends and your family your memories your loved ones etc you know these things if they get lost or encrypted i mean most of us don't have a million us lying around maybe jonathan i don't know all right, um, but yeah, it could spread across the network to all devices, servers, your cloud storage, your phones, your 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 Internet of Things devices. And I expect that in the coming years, ransomware will only spread more and more and more to everything, right? You, you might even hear about um, uh, huge cl cloud storage companies being hit and so on, because I am pretty sure somewhere out there, there is a ransomware gang working on this stuff. I, we are absolutely not going to bash any of these ransomware gangs out there because those guys are very dangerous criminals and we are just but tiny guppies in the, the pond and these guys are megalodons out there in, in the ocean and we really don't want CFSI stuff to be hacked or encrypted. 
you know so we just an ep i um i am on ep so yeah these are the two basic types of ransom the categories i should say not types necessary right but the crypto ransomware is the ones that use the cryptography type encryption to to just lock up a user's access your data to files but then we have locker ransomware which just lock, locks you out of your your computer or your device completely so it gets pretty scary because if you've maybe even looked at some uh you know, some news clips or something like that about ransomware. Let's say for a hospital, for example, you know, you, you have MRI machines and monitors and all of these things. Imagine that those are affected and those get lock, locked up. You're talking about people's lives there. And then we have um, big hits on, on utility companies, I think in, in London recently, um, one of the water companies were locked up. Um, any of you guys remember which one that was that hit them or which group? I want, I'm gonna say, I was gonna say Lockbit, the 3.0, but I can't see for sure. Um, this was how long ago? This was like, like a few this weeks ago. last week. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, really yeah, recently. Very recent. Um, I think it was um Thames uh water utility company or something like that. But the story behind that is pretty interesting because I think um they managed to to hack them. It was by one of the hacker groups, the ransomware gangs that hacked them and realized that they were doing stuff. Well, it's it's alleged they were doing some some underhanded stuff and the ransomware company was telling them to fix their stuff um, or else they were going to expose them or something like that all right so we have that is an issue that we have to look at as well all right with the statistics that that i have here i mean it's it's pretty scary when when you look at the different types of cyber crime and cyber espionage because ransomware could be a bit of all of those things that you have next to the circle there any the legend with cyber crime cyber espionage hacktivism even um people would execute ransomware for different reasons, right? I mean, you could even have disgruntled employees. Which company does not have disgruntled employees? I know Dave was always trying to... Um... <laughs> anyway, that's for, that's for another... <laughs> that's a story for another day. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have some um, some activism with, um, with Vanda. Vanda the God, yeah. yeah. Exactly. I'm not sure if you're... That was, that was when? That was maybe 2019? Yeah, that was a while ago. Yeah, but... A lot of, that was about three years ago. Yeah, actually, I think it was 2019. Mm. 2019, yeah. No, yeah. started to work in this current in my current job. Yeah, Correct. he had a ball. Actually, yeah, it it was around August in 2019. I, I remember that, and most of the ministry sites um got hit with lo lockdown. Um, Ministry of uh, National Security and um a, a good bit of them, I think, even down to tourism, one of them got hit as well, if, if I'm not mistaken. Right, so hacktivism in particular is where people just want to make a, a statement or they against um, government, government practices, company practices, and just like an activist would, you know, protest. I guess hacktivism is where you would hack um, a company, a website, expose their data, leak their data, which is a big issue that we have now. Cyber espionage is not something to be taken lightly because you have a lot of competitors, and between competitors, you never know things things could go wrong. You could plant people. I mean, you know, somebody could send Johnny to sabotage CFSI or something like that. Maybe his his good friend from another place that, whose name we shall not speak of. Twenty fifth of July, twenty nineteen. Twenty fifth ah. of July, twenty nineteen, by Vander de God, who we yeah. still have no clue where they reside. People say they're from Brazil. We have no evidence of that, and we don't know anything about takedowns. This is a pretty um interesting chart here that I got from hackmageddon.com, right? So the all of the charts and the images that I've put up, I've tried to put the links there for you all so that um, when you go through the slides, you can just maybe click on some of these links, bookmark them. They're pretty useful, and there's some of them are sites that I, I click on every day. Um, malware in general, I mean, is is any type of bad software, right? I think mal sp Spanish for bad in, in particular, and then we have hardware, software, firmware. So malware is anything adverse and bad that you could think about. Um, we have a lot of stuff that's unknown, right? Um, a lot of DDoS attacks, but I mean, this is just the general trend that people know about. You have a lot of companies, especially locally, even in Trinidad and Tobago, that do not want to um, make it public that may, they may have been hit. And sometimes it, it, it actually is understandable, right? Because um, for obviously obvious reasons, which we'll actually cover in a bit. 
these are some of the biggest types of ransomware, right? Look at that big red section there, as Alex just mentioned, there's something called Lockbit. And there's also Lockbit version 2 and Lockbit version 3 now, right? Because they're just right. that, well, not good, but dangerous. Um, any of you guys want to comment on any, any of them before we, we talk about others? Just that they are the bane of anybody's existence if we have to deal with them. Pretty much. Once you, um, well, it, IT business doesn't matter. Yeah, I was cool. gonna say um one of the most commonly occurring one is that that I I always pronounce it incorrectly on purpose that conti. Conti. I've seen that yeah. locally and regionally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I've seen um well it's not on this list here. Um, but it'd be well, actually, it should be. That's Revil. Revil is a very common one as well. Yeah, that was the of Revil. Revil was rampant throughout the Caribbean, actually. Yep. yep, yep. Um, Revil, yeah. they just start back up again uh, last mm -hmm. month. Yeah. yeah, last month. Yeah. They because... have new announcement <laughs> that they're gonna um, do some in-depth analysis, and they actually given some people warnings, as as I said, Shiva, and giving you enough time to to safeguard yourself yep. before they come out your hand, which is pretty conscious of uh <laughs> <laughs> and the least they could do considering some of them will ask 15 million us dollars in ransom yeah, in so ransom. thanks for that guys <laughs> we had that no offense no offense to any ransom my gangs out there i'm sorry i'm really sorry don't <laughs> yeah this this was just a graphic that i pulled from this website here which is key-la.com they have a really good report there right so this was just one of the the pics that i put i try to credit every single image that I, I put up inside of here i do believe in giving credit where it's due this um this is pretty interesting right if your organization experience a ransomware attack what area of your business do you suspect would be most negatively impacted Right, and this was by on a site called ransomware.org where they did a survey of a lot of um, CSOs and CIOs and CEOs and stuff like that. 26%, right, two things, operations and reputation. Because think about it, if you hear that a bank was hit with ransomware, first thing you are, you know, you, you, you're wondering about, was is my money okay? My money. The first question would be like, do I have any money in the bank? And the second question would be like, is that money safe? And Johnny has um, Republic credits, apparently, <clears throat> which he owes <laughs> us, Joel. A thousand Republic credits. Yeah. Um, Alex and Joel have some pretty big business impact analysis, guys. Guys, I don't know if you want to share something with us or your thoughts on this, by chance, if anything. You want to jump in first, Alex? Sure. So, so one of the things I've always seen when we do um when we do incident response particularly when ransomware and even just regular uh hacking activities occur in environments a lot of companies take the stance that pre prior to the attacks that you know um they have nothing to lose or they can be impacted in such a way that they can't continue the operations and we have seen that in the cases regionally with um I think they further down any slide anyway um but essentially what happened they got hit with revo this company got hit with revo and it was like business like as usual for them and they had staff working night and day trying to restore data from the same backers that they weren't testing and they assumed that the attackers wouldn't get access to but guess what the attackers got access to the same backups that they said were protected so mm -hmm. from an operational standpoint we are talking human resource and people capital being compromised and impacted so people can't focus on their day-to-day -day activities we talk about regular day-to-day -day activities where customer information can be processed or anything like that we talk about the financial impact because now some of the staff have to be paid over time to input this lost data we talk, it's, the impact of these things is not what people think it is where it's just it have to come in and fix this yeah. is everyone is going to be impacted by significantly impacted by it yeah, and training and all these things is, is not even enough for this anymore. Sure. Joe? Yeah, yeah. Um, he hit the nail on the head there. So um, while, while those things are uh, very excellent points that a lot of, and especially CARICOM businesses, choose to overlook those uh, particular pain points uh, with respect to, one, understanding the risk involved, and we'll talk about risk heavily later on as well. Um, as much as anyone would like to talk about risk, but they don't understand um, what is the 
reputational impact upon the operations, which are coincidentally the two biggest factors that you can see here on this pie chart, because each of them uh, affects each other in tandem, right? Um, your reputation affects your operations and, and operations affect your reputations. And together they account for more than 50% of what is going on within the organization. So when a lot of people say that, well, we'll deal with it, <laughs> um, I don't think they understand just how big of an impact that they will have to deal with. And the thing is that uh, when looking at the holistic picture as a whole, um, and everybody knows that prevention is better than cure, right? The steps that are, are supposed to be put in place are put in place for a reason. Um, the fundamental aspects of understanding the protection against threats like ransomware are listed across a number of frameworks that are very easily accessible free and open to anybody on the internet. Um, so resourcing should not be an, an, an issue or a challenge, but applying those uh, frameworks to the organization is where I think most of the challenges lie within the, the CARICOM regions, especially, and even to, into some international organizations as well. But uh, it is what it is, and we'll try to see how best organizations can cope moving forward. True, because everybody assumes that the impact is, is only IT related, but just like when we consider the attack surfaces and things like a threat landscape, you know, these, these things are quite far reaching. And then uh, the disruption duration, it varies. There's no way that you can come out much like a local entity did recently and said that we should be back up and operational in a couple of days. There's, there's no way because if you, if you are infected, that means that you have to look at every single piece of, of, equipment um, connected, not just equipment, but what about your, your human resources? What about their, their personal access, their personal devices, all of these things? Um, it can take anywhere from days to weeks to months. 3% said months, but that could just be, you know, something about business. I mean, obviously no business would want to say that, well, we would be disrupted in our services for a very long time. So yeah, the majority of them might say about um, days. Um, I'm impressed. I would really love to know who who said that they would be up in a, a couple hours because they are um, prepared. Because as far as I know, and from what I've read and researched in the past few days about this, um, I don't think people understand what, what they're up against when you, you, you speak about ransomware, right? This was uh, local in our region that, we, that we're that trying to get to, right? Which was um, Ansa Macal, one of the biggest conglomerates in the Caribbean when they were hit. Um, I think this this was uh, the Reval ransomware. Um, yeah, and I don't think it was discovered immediately, right? Much like um, what happened with Cisco as well. I think it happened at one country. From what I've told, what I was told, sorry, um, it happened in, in one country in the Caribbean. And then I think when someone at a, a different country tried to access it, then and only then they realized um, what was going on, right? And I mean, sometimes it's not possible to immediately confirm a ransomware attack because again you have to discover something called an ioc an indicator of compromise or indicators of compromise right it's not all the time that you're actually going to see a splash screen come up on the the screen and tell you that something is locked because obviously you may have um antivirus programs and protection systems so sometimes the ransomware is very elusive but it may more than likely at least just delete those type of indicators which are very important because if you don't know what type of ransomware you are infected with, that is a very large problem. You're going to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what type of ransomware it is. And as you all will see, some of the ransomware groups, they get very aggressive when you do not respond to them in within a day or two, and they launch a bunch of other attacks there for you. Case in point, Cisco. Cisco was recently hacked by the Yan Luang ransomware gang i really hope i pronounce their name right the Yan... ransomware yeah. we are absolutely not making fun of that <laughs> ransomware gang. all right so um it, it this was this was pretty interesting right because the access vector the way that they got in supposedly was by something called phishing and then there's vishing anybody wants to just give a little description of vishing and phishing there alex joe deal <laughs> deal <Smiley guys. laughs> so phishing 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 
it's most common. Everybody has gotten that email from that prince in Nigeria that um, wants to send you a million dollars for benefic- for beneficiaries for your lost one, for your lost loved one in Kenya. I don't know how much of you actually have uh, relatives living in Kenya that are wealthy enough to send you two million dollars in gold bars. Um, but that is one of the most common emails that a lot of people have received and from the phishing. And the phishing is the equivalent, but from the phones. Uh, right. where you get a phone call and um, actually that's a pretty thing that occurred earlier this year if i remember correctly where people were getting phone calls from places like um seychelles and maldives yeah. via whatsapp particularly where they were offering maybe services or maybe you know or, or the that um was what's it the samsung guy calling to fix yeah. your phone Very <laughs> a samsung guy. yeah 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 so that's and a so... common yeah, yeah, we have phishing, we have vishing, we even have something called smishing, which is SMS as well. But basically, it's any type of attack that tries to get you to give up or to fish for information, and right? Um, so it was... General, uh, smishing, uh, every day, um, I'll be getting phone calls about smishing attacks. Mm-hmm. It's, it's so very, very common. Especially on a certain network that Joel probably works at. Hey. Whose, whose name we shall not We have an audio issue. We have an audio issue. <laughs> <laughs> what what color is it? Alcatel. But, uh, but uh, <laughs> we also have spear fishing and wheeling mm-hmm. and stuff like that too. Um, there have been instances of successful spear fishing attacks uh, in Trinidad, uh, which is where Stanford, uh, Stanford University, they, they had a, a report that said one in every 10 fishing attacks were successful. That is very, very disturbing. To know that even now where you, you try to preach as much as possible to to staff and co-workers do not click on links and so on um you know it happens right but what happened with cisco was that they realized that they they could not get into the the organization directly so they did the next best thing they analyzed the threat landscape they increased their attack surface or they looked for an increased and extended attack surface your threat landscape is just pretty much it encompasses anything that could be um attacked something that could be vulnerable could act as a threat right and in this case what they did was they went after someone's personal email address and they sent a phishing um via phishing attack and phishing attack as well and multi-factor authentication fatigue attacks um eventually they, they got through to an employee and they decided to go through um the saved passwords so a lot of you all, I know, I'm guilty of this myself, we save passwords sometimes in our browsers with Chrome, Firefox, um, Brave. I use Brave browser a lot, right? Um, that is that is actually not a good idea, right? Um, because that's how they actually got the the Cisco VPN password. And from there, they had a from there they had a, a direct link with where we have the initial access. So the threat actor was that an access broker with ties to the Russian UNC 2477 group and Yan Luang Ransom Gang, right? The the Yan Luang Ransom Wei Gang is a is a very well organized gang. I think that name Yan Luang is um, a Chinese god that rules over the ten kings of hell. Um, you know, just to, to give you an idea, but they really gave a lot of um, information into that. I'm not saying that they are Chinese, right? But it's just a pretty intimidating um, thought to think about. So initial access was done through the VPN. The ransomware deployed was not stated by Cisco, but um, this happened in May 2022, right? And it was only disclosed on a leak site in August 2022. And that's how Cisco was able to know that we actually were the victims of this. Right, so May, June, July, August, three months, right? And the only way that they knew was because of the leak site for the Yan Luang um, ransomware gang, which is, I wouldn't say embarrassing because it happens a lot more than you think, right? And they have very, very clever methods of um, deploying, dropping, concealing, right? Um, it's actually an attack framework that Johnny might be able to tell us a little bit about when we um we go for it. Um, the remediation released by Cisco in their official release is that they just decided to reset all passwords throughout the company. I'm hoping that more was done. I'm sure that more was done, but this is obviously maybe all that they wanted to give out there because after a ransomware attack and you hear some a company like Cisco was hit by a ransomware um, attack because of course Cisco also creates firewalls just like um, Checkpoint and Fortinet and those guys, Palo Alto, Checkpoint is pretty much at the, at the top, probably, of, of firewalls as far, I don't know, Joel, you, wait, yeah, yeah, all, of those, all, of, 
yeah, all of those guys do a, a pretty um, good job uh, yeah. in terms of protection. But uh, what a lot of people don't uh, take into consideration is that uh, security mechanisms are not a set it and forget it type infrastructure, right? Uh, you constantly need to uh, ensure that you harden, firstly, uh, the infrastructure that you're on, even if it's firewalls as well. Um, people need to stop including any any rules. That is the most Anyway, uh, moving on from that, uh, any any rules just negate any security mechanisms that you have in place. Please, you want to explain a little bit about the any any rule for the people that may not know what it is? Uh, sure. So uh, a lot of these um, security firewalls and other tools, uh, it could be virtual, it could be physical, it could be intrusion detection system, it could be CASB, it could be cloud-based firewalls. It doesn't really matter what you put in place. The purpose of security mechanisms is to inspect what it is you're trying to do from a source to destination perspective. So when users are trying to uh, gain access to something and the organization has put security controls in place, um, they're going to say, we don't have time to test something. We just need you to grant access. And mm -hmm. sometimes the pressures, the pressures that be that come from the top or whatever inv is involved in what you're doing, uh, say that we we just give the, need to give these people access. Let's just create the any a, a rule that says any source to any destination for this traffic allow it. And I mean that may be fine for testing something, but you need to remove those types of rules. And they aren't just present in firewalls; they are present in uh, host detection systems (IDS, HIDs). They're they're present in uh, endpoint packages where you create uh, white lists for different uh, group segments and um, internet-based public resources. Uh, so we need to stop thinking about just giving access because somebody needs access, but think of it from the organizational perspective of who, what, why, when, and uh, did I say who already? Who, what, why, yeah. when, and how? Right? Uh, why do you need this access? Is it re is it needed from a business perspective? What are the business drivers be requesting this type of access, and why? Is this a permanent form of access? Um, mm -hmm. Should we keep relooking this? Let's set check marks in the organization to say every three months, let's relook the security infrastructure for this section here, or let's do a a, a biannual check uh, on the infrastructure, whether it be virtual, cloud, mm -hmm. on-prem hosted doesn't really matter what it is yeah as you all can tell joel is very passionate about what he does i would like to know about hardening joel sorry i would like to know more about hardening <laughs> sure you do. Sure you do. so anyway we have we have ras <laughs> Ran somewhere as a service, and I cannot keep a straight face now. Thank you very much, my good sir. Oh, before we continue, I saw um, Simon. Thanks for that. Simon was telling us that um, the the ransomware attack on the water company in London. It was the South Staffordshire Water um, Company in London that was hit recently. And uh, the majority of attacks going forward, you would find that it was it it was. Um, in, in some sort of collaboration with not just a, a sole type of ransomware. Sometimes it may be a combination of different types of ransomware. The ransomware gangs are actually getting together to come up with better types of ransomware. So ransomware is evolving. And this is where we have ransomware as a service. Just as where we have software as a service, we have everything as a service, downloads as a service, um, something that you offer, even cloud as a service, whatever you want to talk about as, if you offer it as a service. right? So it's now a business model. And usually before, I mean, ransomware, I, I first learned about ransomware maybe around 20, between 2012 to uh, 2014 with WannaCry and some of those some of those guys out there. And um, it wasn't anything like this. It was where you had to go on the deep web or the dark web and do a lot of digging and join some forums and pay a lot of money for this. But now if you have maybe like 100 or 200 US, you could actually get a subscription to some of these uh, ransomware as a service providers. Mm -hmm. Some of the most um, uh, dominant ones, I would say, right? Uh, Darkside, Reval, Lockbit, one called Dharma as well. We have quite a few of them. These these aren't just all that we have out there. But just like you would subscribe to a service, like if you pay for Netflix and you subscribe to that service and you something goes wrong, you, you want to contact some port, you want to call them and stuff, you may not be able to call them, but they would at least have chat support and stuff, right? 24-7 20, support, actually. Different packages, licensing models, they have gone all out, 
right? But the main takeaway point that I have below there is that ransomware is accessible to anyone with an internet connection. You do not have to be a pro. You do not have to be a technical genius and know about this, that, and the other. Even getting onto the dark web, um, which I don't recommend, by the way, there's a 99.999% chance you will get hacked. I think, um, I think yeah, I think Johnny had a, a cool experience where um, he, he tried to go on and someone called him by his name and turned on his camera and stuff like that. Hopefully, hopefully he was dressed. I don't know. I remember so, the first time I tried to go onto the, the dark web and that was some years ago where I, where I had one of those um, towers. I didn't have a laptop. I had a, de a desktop. And my CD drive opened for itself, <laughs> and I'm, nope, <laughs> just gonna power, uh, push the power button one time. Um, Shiva, one thing with the 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 RAS, the uh, ransomware as a service, a lot of the ransomware uh, groups. Now I was reading an article; they actually bundling the ransomware with polymorphic malware. Yeah. Um, and selling it as a bundle. Um, so you yeah. know, you, you get ransomware, Discount. you get ransomware plus for a, a better price. Discounts. Yeah, discounts, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. discounts and bundles. Discount and, and that polymorphic um, malware that they was talking about there, it means that if you download um, the infection or the infected files, as soon as you download that stuff and it is on your machine, it morphs into something else. If antivirus yeah, detects it, it morphs malware. into something else. There's malware that is, um, that is capable of um, changing um, its mm -hmm. identifiable features. Yeah. Um, in order to evade detection. Uh, so, those are the ones that, that stick in RAM as well, too, right? Yeah, you have to yeah, 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 the yeah, residents yeah, as well. Um, um, in fact, the, the um, volatile memory, they could actually infect, you know, your ROM chips on your motherboard, your GPU, your processor. If they get into your hardware, well, I mean, That's take it, it burn it down somewhere. <laughs> time, time to throw your graphics card in your microwave, which actually yeah, yeah, did not yeah. do. I just say that's out there. Don't take our advice. We are definitely not licensed to give advice. But um, yeah, as they were saying, that's, that's pretty um, a pretty dangerous one that they are moving to because they, they actually install your ransomware in the chipset. So a lot of you all might know about your BIOS, which is responsible for holding some settings that first starts up your machine and so on. How do you go about scanning your BIOS itself with antivirus? You usually just maybe upgrade your firmware. And that's about it. Just like how you download your firmware updates for your phones and, and other devices, right? It actually goes sometimes into the chipset itself. And you know, from, from that point, I mean, it's safe to say that you, you, you're screwed. Um, a lot of them, you see this thing called remote desktop protocol. If you do not need remote desktop protocol, please disable remote desktop protocol. Even your team viewer and um, what's the other one? Not team viewer. Any desk. Any desk. Any desk. Yeah. Right. Log, if um, log me in, <laughs> log me in. All, all of these remote access applications, uh, ransomware gangs, they love this stuff because a lot of them are actually infection points now for ransomware gangs. They would usually scan your firewalls, your endpoints, and look for the ports that these operate out of. And if they detect that you may have any desk and team viewer and all of these things running, um, there could be a chance that yours may be outdated. And uh, having outdated hardware software firmware in particular that's the easiest way to get compromised um interestingly enough too we have affiliates sorry joe go ahead oh no i just wanted to raise one but you raise a real good point there about the um those programs i did see one article that was looking at a uh, man in the middle and they were looking for outbound traffic mm -hmm. so if they detect the outbound traffic going to the services like any desk log me in and stuff like that what they do is that they mirror the reverse destination ports so your outbound traffic is going with a standard destination port but the return traffic is coming back with a randomized port so there's no way your infrastructure will know what inbound port number is going to come back in on that yeah. session whether it be tcp or udp so what they do is that they insert a uh, man in the middle and then they randomize the number so they did piggyback on the same session it's called session hijacking and then they, mm -hmm. they infiltrate that session and then they get back into the uh, infrastructure on a legitimate TCP or UDP session uh, with a randomized port number that is actually coming from a source machine inside the network. Um, anybody wants to just touch on that lateral movement inside the network there to just explain it a little bit better to the audience? Attend CFSI CH class on a Saturday and you'll learn exactly how to do this. Besides, <laughs> besides having to pay for class, yeah. if Alex would like to explain <laughs> Come a bit. On hard. 
<laughs> How to explain? Sorry, lateral movement. Yeah. So lateral movement is when you compromise a machine with an account, and instead of trying to elevate it to a like an administrator level account, you move laterally across the network and see if you get another component of the network where you may not need to use um, administrator level credentials. That's yeah. essentially what lateral is. So lateral literally means moving horizontally across the network. Vertical mm -hmm. means you elevate it to a different level of access. And a lot of people assume too that we're talking about computers and servers. This could go as low down as printers, right? Um, I, they, I can't remember how many years ago, but there was a um, an exploit called uh, fax, faxploit using fax machines because a lot of older fax machines are directly connected via a phone line, right? So if you have your organization, you have a fax machine, an older fax machine, and you do not use this fax machine, please make sure that it's disabled, the phone line is unplugged. Um, your wireless printers as well. I mean, it may sound stupid, but all, all of these things can be compromised. Remember, this is stuff that we do for a living as well, not just stuff that we research, not just stuff that we teach, right? I actually um, dealt with a credit union that had an attack, and the main point of attack was a bunch of televisions at um, their waiting lobby. These televisions were connected via Wi-Fi to something outside. The TV firmware was not updated. And these, I think it was, a, there were Samsung TVs and the apps themselves were vulnerable. A bunch of, um, I think it was Java apps or outdated apps. Because think about it, all of us inside this webinar, do any of you all update the firmware on your TV, on your television? And what about even your routers and so on? And do we just assume that the ISPs are sending us the latest versions of the firmware that we need for modems and routers and all of these things? You need to start looking at everything because this will... Um, help you map out your threat landscape and your attack surface. These are very important things to know. And we don't have to be hackers to find your devices connected over the internet, right? Um, we, we will mention a couple of things to you all that, that anyone can use, not just a hacker, right? But we'll, we'll demo these things um, early in September when we have the, the other one. This ransomware affiliate business is ridiculous because um, it, it's so easy. I follow these guys on Twitter, VX Underground. I, I've been actually following their website since maybe 2002 or two, 2004, um, somewhere around there. They, they give really good information and technical analysis. Um, so ransomware is a decentralized crime. An affiliate can be in multiple ransomware groups or operate independently, totally up to them. This is why TTPs overlap so heavily, right? With the um, tactical and technical procedures, you'll find that a lot of ransomware types, they all are, a lot of them are very, very similar in the way that they, they operate and they exploit lateral movement, vertical movement, whatever it is. All right, so it, it's more than just, you know, the, the professional hackers, which are uh, guys like us, the red teamers and the pen testers. These are DevOps specialists, networking specialists. Some of them are programmers. Um, it doesn't mean that, you know, you have to be a genius to do this stuff because the groundwork is already there. When we get into the different types of ransomware, you realize that some of these types of ransomware were built on other existing types of ransomware. Right, so the groundwork has already been done. Some some of these groups they just focus on evasion um, and maybe encryption types and techniques and stuff like that. So the affiliates in particular compartmentalize. Oftentimes they're not aware of who in the group and who is not, which might be good for them for obvious reasons. Because if one goes down, you know you can't exactly bring down the rest of them like we had back in the day with uh, Lulsec and. Um, Sabu and Anonymous and, and stuff where I think Sabu was placed as an infiltrator and helped bring down Lulsec and, and, and parts of Anonymous and so on. Lulsec. Right? Um, yeah, that was, that was good times. Um, that, oh, that was a long time. Oh, that was 2010, 2011 or something like that when, when Anonymous actually just, just came out. Good but time. it's pretty dangerous because the affiliates may group together to make cliques within ransomware groups unknown to the RAS and it, it gets pretty uncontained it's just a breakout of what you thought was hell and now you have factions of hell um going after you so you all can search for them on twitter follow them they have some pretty good stuff um yeah and uh, ignore the ransomware architecture for dummies part up here right this was posted by them today as well right but this is this is the ecosystem for affiliates in particular right where you have ras investors developers you do have persons and even some 
units out there that invest in ransomware and ransomware types, right? You have the Alt V, you have Lockbit, um, which from what I've read has been associated with Russia, right? But basically they would employ the use of botnets for spread, especially this Emotet botnet. Emotet spreads so randomly out in the wild and it's a type of Trojan. And for those of you who don't know, a Trojan is just something where you have something malicious inside of something else. If you know the story about um, the Trojans and Troy and the gift horse, where they, they, they give them um, the, the big wooden horse, but it you know had people inside and when they were asleep, they came out and plundered the village, etc. All right, but um, you have the developers, they create an actual ecosystem. You have a huge ransomware marketplace, just like how you have the App Store and the Google Play Store. You actually have a ransomware marketplace on the dark web and the deep web out there that you all could visit. And these are where some of these affiliates go and they subscribe or they, they try to work with the ransomware group. So for example, LV and Lockbit, um, they, might, they, they might have a bunch of developers together, but they would put together these services and then you can now go and say, okay, well, I wanna become an affiliate. I want to help you all um, attack and compromise this particular business. So let's say that, you know, deal right, wants to be an affiliate and he wants to compromise CFSI, right? So he goes onto the dark web and he signs up to be an affiliate and he maybe subscribes or purchases and he chooses what type of ransomware, like Lockbit Vision 3, for example, that he would like to use inside CFSI. So what happens there now is that um, the Lockbit group would say, okay, well, we need 40% of whatever they pay, right? So they would say, okay, well, yeah, 60%, you know, of let's say that they ask for $1 million, $3 million. That's a lot of money, right? And that's, I have to say that that's, that's a very expensive looking um, t-shirt that they was wearing today. So, you know, we have, we have to, you know, keep on. How keep on. to buy ransom away. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and these are where we come up with the indicators of compromise. Uh, anyone wants to take this one? Me. Okay. Joe, um, go ahead. So, <laughs> I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> uh, so there are various forms of IOCs and IOCs come in all shapes, forms and sizes. Um, but typically the average person doesn't understand, know what to look for in an IOC, um, how to set the baselines for IOC and what IOC could contain on the infrastructure. Uh, technology is changing so fast, right? Um, we have so many different types of platforms on the infrastructure. Gone are those days where you just have switches and servers and computers and you have a bunch of hardware. Those things are gone. Um, the organization today looks um, uh, as a mix of uh, on-premise switching and routing and security, uh, hardware on-prem, then there's cloud architecture, right? Then you have um, this, the new emerging technologies for DevOps and DevSecOps that will come along with it. And then there's a whole different range. So the potential for IOCs are no longer limited to one variable uh, on a platform. They now spread across a multitude of hierarchies across the infrastructure. So what you have to look for will be ever expanding. Um, and the way to do this is to invest in proper tools. And organizations hate when you put forward a solution that costs $2, but these things cost a lot of money. And whether yeah. they exist as, um, tools that will be present in firewalls, in software, in VMs, in the cloud, uh, doesn't matter which cloud um, that you're part of, AWS, Azure, whatever it is, um, we have to ensure that we uh, put systems in place that will look for these types of IOCs and ensure that they uh, look for the baselines across the infrastructure and across each vertical in the organization, no matter which technology line that they may be in. Right, and as you can see here, they, they include various forms um, that they may they take the shape and form of uh, PowerShell scripts, um, Windows script files, uh, file extensions. Uh, one of the older cheat codes that we used to use uh, when you couldn't uh, send files across the network was to just change the file extension and send it to somebody, and then they re reverse it on the other end. Um, but that is now backfiring because uh, these file extensions can be anything. So what you need to look for is ever expanding and there's no way that you can keep up um, to understand how uh, and where to look for these ransomware IOCs. So the best form of advice that we can probably offer, not 
not give you, but just offer, is to invest in the necessary tools and technologies that specialize in these forms of IOC and follow the best practices that come from those vendors. Yeah, and just add to that, you are, um, sometimes if you're just lucky enough, you could actually get a guy and I'll actually just tell you, hey, we have your files. I'll just put it on a splash screen. We did our <laughs> assessments, Alex and I, they, they went through our, our reports and they just pretty much said, you know, blinking bonds up, locked by whoever. So if you're lucky like that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know who to pay. Get you. I, I have I have a link on a slide somewhere where it shows the um the splash screens as you were talking about for the majority of them. I think for each one of each type of ransomware, I did put it here so that you all would see, but it's not always that simple because as I mentioned, sometimes your antivirus and the systems that you have in place could actually delete these things because these are files that may have also been included with the ransomware. So sometimes the entire folder may be quarantined or something like that. But you know, for different file names, these are these are not necessarily what you are going to see, but you're going to start noticing some some pretty strange file names, right? Um, I remember there was a, a free piece of software back in the day called Ransom Free, and what it did was that it created some random files on um, systems and in, in various folders, right? It was available for Windows, and if at any point in time any one of those files were were compromised or the extension changed, it would immediately let you know that you should probably um, look into this immediately, disconnect from your network, etc., which is pretty awesome. But that's a clear indicator of compromise, right? So you have file names. Sometimes it may be cut and dry about what type it is. For example, we have you know the lock button, some temp, some icons, uh, different types of wallpaper. For example, is it is quite common for ransomware attacks to actually show that you know change your wallpaper and put something up about you've been compromised. Please contact. XYZ to to start the recovery the recovery process. All right, so um, I just want to touch briefly on the anatomy of the ransomware attack before we actually jump into some of the different ones we we have out there like React and Darkside and Revel and a couple of them. All right, so the attackers would discover a target company and I want to we want to look at that in particular. I think we'll we'll have Johnny talk about that for some OSINT or open source intelligence and the attackers would launch attacks against individuals resources. Um, pretty much what whatever they discover, because while a lot of companies have this, as Joel would say, the set and forget mentality, where we have a firewall, so we have all the policies on the firewall, it works, we are allowed access, so we assume, okay, great, it's working, we can look at different dashboards and see that things are blocked, right? But it doesn't just, you know, begin or end but with your firewall, you're phishing, smishing, vishing, um, lots of different types of uh, attacks and, and, and in you know, the, the different various methods that they could gain gain access, right? And then we have different types of malware loaders and droppers, which would usually get into the system and then allow you to um, go ahead and, and, and proceed with infection. But that fourth point there is pretty important. If you're not sure what Cobalt Strike is, you'll need to go ahead and, and research a little bit about Cobalt Strike. Um, because in recent times, tools such as Cobalt Strike have been utilized to deploy the ransomware. Cobalt Strike is actually a tool for penetration testing. Um, some of you all may know about Cobalt Strike and may be familiar with something called Meta um, Metasploit, right? Or the Metasploit um, framework, in particular MSF. Uh, Cobalt Strike, I believe, is really just like a, a graphical user interface to to Metasploit. I I prefer Metasploit over Cobalt Strike. That's just a personal preference, but Imagine if these, these these people are actually able to leverage Cobalt Strike and send out what we call Cobalt Strike beacons as well across the network to determine who else is out there. So this is where we, we come back to the later, lateral movement and the vertical movement. So basically they are inside your organization and they are just discovering everything inside of there. And they also have the ability to attack your machines, attack your um, safety mechanisms, disable it, disable processes running on the machines and stuff. And then after it does all of that, the encryption process begins and some sort of ransomware is made, usually in Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is somewhat anonymous. Um, as of today, Bitcoin is currently worth uh, 23,000 US for one, but it depends because Bitcoin goes up and down. I think at its highest point sometime last year, it was maybe about 60 or 70,000 US for one Bitcoin. And some of these ransomware gangs are so successful and profitable that they even reach out to you via their chat feature and offer you a discount because they've already made so much profit. Some of these ransomware gangs have made in excess of 100 million US in a couple of years, right? So 
this is what Johnny was talking about, right? Where you have this splash screen. I believe this would have been more for the older one, like uh, WannaCry. I actually saw this way back in 2014 when I was just starting to play around with ransomware and decided to play Brave, and that was the end of that laptop. <coughs> um, because I think, yeah, the BIOS actually was infected as well. But yeah, this is what Revel, you... Revel just leaves a little note on your desktop. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't necessarily be that. It might be just a, a little notepad text file or, or something like that. And it doesn't okay. just apply to Windows. It applies nope. to every operating system out there, right? You have even mobile types of ransomware. So your Android phones, your iPhones as well. You have to be very careful. It may be more common for Android phones because we have such a variety of Android phones existing. And um, some of the, the cheaper ones, you find that the updates are few and far between at particular times. All right, so yeah, these are the files of change ex extensions. So sometimes it's very easy to, to actually tell what type of ransomware it is if you look at the um, extension. But of course, for the newer types and sometimes, unfortunately, the more dangerous types, you don't, it's not just cut and dry. And just a tiny bit of advice, if you all are infected with ransomware, don't go trying to download every ransomware decryptor out there because it may very well be another type of ransomware that you've just included into your systems there, right? So you, it, it's, it's very scary. It's incredibly frustrating, right? But this is just where we are at this point in our lives with technology. Um, yeah, somebody else take this with TTPs, not TTPS. Nobody? Nobody? All right, cool. I'll <laughs> take it. All right, so techniques, tech tactics and procedures. So this is essentially what the attackers would usually use and their workflow of how they would actually gain access. Um, that initial access point, then they would actually execute the ransomware, control it and discover additional resources that they could maybe use, utilize later on, and then so on, and then actually execute the ransomware. So that initial access is what we speak of is where the attackers actually get that first doorway into your corporate environment or your home environment. That is what the initial access speaks to. The common place for that would be um, the phishing emails that we spoke about earlier, phishing, smishing, anything like that. Um, that would be the, that is the most common um, method still of gaining that initial access into any environment. Like Joel mentioned before, all you could put all the firewalls and protection mechanisms in place. See that user aspect where they see that email and they still click that link, that is how these attackers get inside. And then what they would do from not just the execution standpoint, they would, an execution standpoint, not meaning the, the ransomware itself, um, but some sort of additional mechanism where they could maintain some level of access, right? So in one of the investigations we did, um, they actually installed something called Go, I think it was Ghost Go, or Go Tunnel. Can't remember exactly the name of it, but it's essentially a custom-built um, VPN tunnel written in the Go language, and they installed it as a service within one of the machines in the environment, and it did a call back to the servers they controlled once every hour or something like that, and they would just either terminate the session because they're just monitoring now, or they would actually connect, traverse the network, and do something else, right? So that was that aspect. So that led from the execution into the command and control. So they had essentially now effectively control over the environment, right? Because it so happened that the one person that opened that one email happened to be the administrator. And the IT, specifically the IT manager of that company, opened the email. So they had, they didn't even need to look for elevated privilege in this case, right? So from that standpoint, they would go about and try and discover what else is on the network that they could use either to spread across the network or ensure that when they do execute the ransomware, that they, they lock down the organization pretty hard so they could demand more. Again, case in point, encrypting the backups that the organization used so that even self, you were able to wipe all the hard drives, you couldn't restore anything back to it. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's the discovery phase. Then we have the privilege escalation. And like I said before, there was a the lateral movement and there's the elevation component of it. And in this case, this is like if you compromise a regular user's account and then you gain access to an administrative level, like a system administrator who has access to make changes across the network. And then from there, again, the collection of the information, more more discovery. It, it tell the trend here, it just goes back in a loop 
You gain access, you discover. You gain more access, you discover. And then finally, you grab what you want. That's the exfiltration phase. And then you execute the ransomware. And now your entire system, your entire network is locked down and no one can do anything. And you are crying for cyber insurance at this point in time. Yeah, and another thing to add to that, Alex, um, when, when we do threat intelligence, we actually talk about the kill chain. That's where it comes in really important. That way, if you could you know, stop them at initial access, you kill the chain, you stop that attack. Let's just say even um, one example, Alex, you remember this one, um, a test user account, we actually got those credentials and it was, we spread it across the network and that was administrative level kind of stuff. So if you just segregate, you know, your accounts, you're going to help yourself out a lot there. So mm -hmm. think about it like that as well. That one was fun, you know. Yeah, that's um, that cyber kill chain and the attack framework, the MITRE attack framework as well. Um, you all might probably want to do a little bit of, uh, of digging up on that with regards to threat intelligence and threat hunting, right? And if if possible, that you could actually stop them at that first phase of initial access, you probably just save the entire network right there. But like Alex was saying, you know, these these backups and stuff there. If you have your backups connected, everything connected, you don't have offline stuff. I mean, a lot of people assume that because they're connected to the cloud and they have stuff in the cloud that they should be safe, but that is not necessarily so. Yeah, how, so. how many people you know have a coal site? Um, exactly. Best money in having a coal site. So uh, that, is, that is probably one of the ways to mitigate it. But I mean, I don't personally know anybody in Trinidad, any organization that has a, a, a full scale level coal site to recover from. Yeah, full scale. I, I'm not. I'm not. I mean, may, maybe they have, but I, I just, I just not aware about the, the full scale coal site. Where that you know everything is offline, it's untouched, it's scanned regularly. It was it was implemented on sanitized servers and disks and all these things. So you know that it's in good pristine condition as well. But um, even if you decide to back up something to your 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 flash drive, your external drive on a personal level as well, you have to be very careful with these things, right? Some some um, cloud storage providers, I think they allow you a rollback feature for about one month or something like that. So if you store your files on, I think. OneDrive and Dropbox and a couple of these for personal users. You know, you should be able to um, to recover something like that. All right. So um, the first one I want to start off with, uh, which is one of my, I won't say my favorite, but I, ha I have a lot of experience with WannaCry ransomware in particular. I've done a lot of forensics for WannaCry where we um, we do forensic acquisition of of someone's memory. So your RAM in your computer. Uh, it holds a lot of information, right? For those of you that are not too familiar about your RAM, your random access memory, your memory of your computer, think about it. Everything that you want to use, it has to be stored in RAM, your username, your passwords, connections, um, lots of stuff is actually stored in the RAM itself. So if you, we will get to this actually yeah, when we get to the technical tools and, and in the next webinar, I'll show you all how these things could be done, where we acquire an image of RAM and then I analyze it with something called volatility and I look at the processes and I can actually pinpoint the where the infection occurred, what processes were infected, even sometimes back to the date and time. But it depends because RAM is volatile. The minute you switch off that machine or in particular restart that machine, that's it. All that valuable data is lost. So this is another sc fl splash screen and you have your Bitcoin address here. So this is why I said it is somewhat anonymous because this long address that we have there um on the send six hundred dollars worth of bitcoin to this address um there's no username there's no actual address it's just a bunch of, of characters that you have there but you can actually search for bitcoin wallets and they will actually tell you what value what values are, are contained inside of there how many bitcoin it is worth how how much transfers were probably done but to actually put that back to a person an individual organization is pretty tough all right so wanna cry um sorry i got a little bit of ptsd there thinking about how much time it took me to put together um all these slides <clears throat> it was one of the first devastating types <laughs> of ransomware and it's been around for at least three or four years before it was announced as a global threat in 2017 because i remember researching ransomware for people in my masters way back in 2014 or 2015 somewhere there right and it was spread via this nasty little exploit that exists up till today uh, most Microsoft Windows machines, Eternal Blue, which is known as, um, they have a couple other names for it. What were the other names for it? 
Blue Keep. Eternal, Eternal Pulse and Eternal Pulse. So yeah, what can I turn on? Turn on Roma. Yeah. Basically, Eternal Blue is an NSA exploit that found its way into the hands of hackers, and then they decided to exploit the NSA exploit and just had access to pretty much everything that you could think about. Um, because Windows use SMB to pretty much communicate with each other. So it's a very easy way to, 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 to spread and have propagation take place, right? And it was, um, it was wormable. So it spread within hours. We're talking about uh, hundreds of thousands of devices. I, as I have any light, last line down there, it's 230,000 devices worldwide. And this is only what they know about in particular when they did some tracing. I think it's way more than that um and that it it is one of the most impressive types of ransomware to date because of the the scale of the infection and the damage done and so on um bitcoin was was only worth three to eight hundred us at that point in time but now three to eight hundred dollars if you get hit with ransomware and they ask for that is mean you know you should probably start thanking the lord for that or something because it can go anywhere from tens to hundreds to thousands and millions and millions of dollars out there, depending on the target. So, but think about it, right? 230,000 devices multiplied by, let's say, at least $600. That's a lot of money out there. Whereas now the ransomware gangs, they would have more dedicated attacks. If they know, okay, this company is very profitable. They've been in the news. They have a lot of new projects going on, a lot of partnerships coming their, their way. Let's target this huge company instead and try to get through to it because they may be able to pay millions, if not billions, who knows? All right. Um, we have this dark side ransomware here as well. And this is what I was just talking about, right? You need to pay 4 million US dollars, right? And at the time, Bitcoin was worth $28,360.79. Um, and they're a bit. I don't even know what to say about this. They have chat support inside of there where you can actually chat with them and try to negotiate with them. But like I said, they sometimes get very aggressive. Dark side is one of the more aggressive types of ransomware gangs out there. This is where we have ransomware as a service coming along. Yeah, right? because they have proper customer support. 24-7 support, you know, not just proper customer support. Customer. Any day, anytime. Would you like to pay us to uh, show we are here? Would you like to pay us some now and some after? We're here for you. Hey, money involved yeah. now, so. Imagine Jackson give you a proper customer support. Six months, no interest. <laughs> Imagine you try to contact your tech company and your service provider and you cannot get through to them because it's midnight on a Saturday, but you can jump on the chat and chat with someone from the dark side. Ah. Yeah, and this is what happened with the colonial pipeline attack, which was a very, very serious attack. Um, I think it was last year, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Right, But it is another ransomware as a service group. So imagine you can go on the dark web and you can try to purchase a subscription and you make a negotiation with Darkseid because they will usually ask you who it is, who's your intended target or intended victim. And they will tell you, they will negotiate, okay, well, you keep 60% or we want 50% or the case may be. Um, but the, the problem is that they are known for, for multiple attacks, I guess you could say, because they sometimes ask you to pay um, once, twice, three times. Because the first time they might ask you to pay just to unlock your data. And the second time is to retrieve exfiltrated data, data which exfil exfiltrated means that it's left your um, your premises and, and, and under your care, for example. And there's also been reports where you have to pay so that they will not release this. So if you want to keep this hush hush, um, that's something that you are going to have to pay for. And that becomes a major issue these days because of the legislation that we have. Um, think about GDPR and stuff. You all, um, and then you guys know what, what is the, um, the penalty for not reporting a breach under GDPR in the European Union? Plenty money. Alex, I think you're muted. I think it's twenty-five percent of yeah. your annual profit or something yeah. like gross, that. Gross profit or something gross like profit. that. Yeah, twenty-five percent. Gross like profit. Yeah. So imagine you made billions and and you re, you didn't report this breach because you're con concerned about you know the outlook by the customers and and your okay. reputation and what have you. Then you get slapped with that fine from GDPR, for example. But I think it's good that we have this type of legislation out there because. 
it sort of makes it forces companies to make sure that they have certain things in place right so that you especially your customer and your client data um are protected for example those of you all that may have contacted cfsi via our um, our website i usually delete all of those messages after about a week or after, even after the conversation is done because we ask for your email address and a phone number so that i can actually call you and discuss stuff if you decide to contact me but i have to delete all those things out there. I mean, even though we don't fall under that type of legislation, it's best practice and it makes sense, right? So um, it's, it's up to 4% of the total global turnover of the preceding fiscal year. That's a lot. Yeah. Not for CFS, eh? but that's a lot. <laughs> if we had, um, <laughs> had legislation like that in CARICOM, um, that'd be a big plus because uh, Organizations down down um, in the Caribbean, even Trinidad is probably the worst. Yes, I agree. Uh, they 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 don't really care about the impact, the reputational impact, because uh, uh, people, the general public, the general uneducated IT public, that is, didn't know um, or how ransomware impacted a, a business, especially their information, especially customer and client oriented businesses. But I mean, through the the, the pandemic, um, when ransomware, uh, I mean, we had an exponential increase in ransomware. Uh, people became aware, uh, the general public, that is, non-tech people, non-IT people, and the reputation, uh, company reputation is now at stake uh, in the Caribbean. Well, to add to that as well, uh, is, is go back to the age-old question sometimes, of um, does business drive IT or does IT drive business? Correct. Both. And then apart from reputation, is it is it that the company is even willing, as Joel mentioned before, to put solutions in place, even if they have to spend $2? And on top of that, you have to look at the fact that we just came out of COVID and a lot of countries are still, you know, grappling with that. A lot of countries are in recession, um, you know, so you have a lot of cuts, take, especially in Trinidad, you have cuts taking place everywhere. IT is becoming affected. And a lot of a lot of these ransomware groups, it's not to say that well, okay, let's just go look for look for a target. They look at the news, they look at the economic climate, they look at what's happening in the news and so on. For example, just a, just a sort of sidetrack, tiny bit, but to compare it, look at in Trinidad and Tobago. For those of us who who are here locally, right? In the last six months, with this tower that keeps going down and causing this blackout in all of Trinidad, right? that has been on the news twice in six months imagine if you have certain groups out there that now realize oh so the fall of this little tower in the middle of nowhere can actually just disable most if not all of trinidad right that says a lot and it was publicized out there that this can happen so what happens if someone just wants to go and you know just damage that for malicious purposes the uh, same yeah, way it applies and yeah, exactly so, uh... Right, if you have some deranged maniac that drives a Ford Ranger into it and topples it over or something, I don't but know. it was Godzilla too. From what we saw, it was Godzilla. Yes. Yeah, I mean, what, what, what if a ransomware um group uh, or organization decide to attack the enter? <sighs> I, one of, one I, of the um, one of the best things about the GDPR, which is um, which is what I wish a lot of other countries would follow, is that instead of telling you how to protect. GDPR tells you what happens if you don't protect. Correct. They do the reverse. So it's like, yeah, you need to protect it. No, no, no. If you don't protect, this is going to happen. Yeah. So you yeah. Protect. And it makes and sense. Very... It does make sense. Yeah, because a lot of businesses locally, uh, they, Alex spoke about it, they don't understand the impact uh, of ransomware on your organization. Correct. A lot of them are actually willing to accept the impact before the attack. Mm -hmm. But after the attack, when they see what actually happens, we we have regional companies that even have a budget for, mm, just for that. cyber attacks and ransomware. A couple attacks. million US dollars just for that, and they just like yeah, we just cover. That's what the budget for, and they move on. The problem with this is that the ransomware yeah. groups liaise with each other, and they know who has paid, and they know who has paid how much. So you have repeated attacks taking place. You know, it's, it's an entire network. Ransomware as a service is a, a huge network. They are all in contact. With each other Anonym anonymously albeit but it still happens right look at um the us and so they offer this 10 million dollar reward right for for members of dark side 10 million us 
for information. Of course, I, I mean, if someone had this information, I don't know if they want to go and publicize that they know about it because I'm pretty sure Dark Side and all those other groups can make your life a living hell for the rest of your life. But this is where it gets um, a bit sticky, right? They get they get very aggressive. If you don't if you don't return um, an email to them or chat with them in about two to three days, they will launch a devastating denial of service attack against all your resources and they will begin leaking your, your data. Um, they will actually try to embarrass you or humiliate you into paying and doing so quickly, right? Some of them even let you know that they may have been responsible for other types of attacks and that this is the type of information they have on those companies and they could possibly release it. So this is where we have to look at the TTPs, right? Well, the, the tactics and the techniques and the procedures involved. So look for things that, that are in common. Um, what I'll introduce you all to is the FBI flash alerts. Those are excellent. They're little two or three page documents that detail all of these things that we're talking about here. And they do give excellent suggestions on mitigation, but the mitigation, when we reach there, you'll realize it's just best practice. So here we have someone who has, or something that has visited us quite frequently in the Caribbean, more than we'd like to know. Even in Trinidad, we have a lot of companies that were hit by, by um, ransomware throughout the Caribbean. It's just that they may not exactly want to divulge this information and we don't have legislation to force them to do so. So reveal ransomware, same type of splash screen. Um, this is actually not bad. This is good sometimes because it may actually give you an idea about what type of ransomware you're dealing with. And not necessarily for the fact that you will know who to communicate with or something like that, but um, sometimes you'll, you'll be able to understand the severity of the ransomware and the attacking group. So, right, um, Reveal, it, it was also known as the Sudden No KB Ransomware, another ransomware group which demands a 40% cut, like I was saying, from the services to affiliates who choose their services, and it became very popular after the shutdown of the Grand Crab Ransomware group, which was a couple of years well back. Um, it's bypassed as the malware is backdoored with a chat. So that chat feature that we saw previously, the reveal operators decided to backdoor the ransomware that they would sell to the affiliates so that when the affiliates go ahead and make this infection happen, let's say that it's an internal threat and someone purchases this ransomware, they carry it to work, they launch it on, maybe they, they disable antivirus on that machine and they launch the ransomware. But these reveal guys are a bit sneaky because they have backdoored the chat and they themselves will instead chat with the, um, the compromised company and try to negotiate with them and say, okay, so whoever put this up here, um, you know, we told them we want 40%, um, but uh, if, if you just willing to give us 30% right now, um, or 30% now, 30% later, we will be promised if you pay us instead not to do this, not to do that, not to do the other. So they, they sort of just undercut their affiliates from time to time, but it is really stupid how you would trust a ransomware group to begin with and assume that they will be you know, fair in their share and your share, right? But um, some of the most notable targets for Reveal, apart from some um, uh, huge conglomerates that we know about would be Lady Gaga, um, a law firm representing Donald Trump, a huge Cassia company, Apple, Acer, HX5, which I think has something to do with NASA and the Navy and their supplier and stuff like that. Demands all the way up to $4 million there. Sorry, four. Um, it actually does go up. I have um four, it looks like $400,000, $4,000, but it's actually $4 million. That was supposed to be a comma. Right, and um, the group, yeah, this this is one of the groups out there, Reveal, that has um, collected into up to 2021. I mean, I don't have the report for 2022 yet. I suppose it may come out at the end of this year. But for last year, at least, they collected at least up to $100 million. And this is only what is known that was paid to them. Right, then we have this one that um, I guess Alex and Johnny as well, um, all, all the guys could actually give a little bit in, input on. Lockbit is pretty elusive, it's very severe, and it is evolving. It's currently up to version three, but um, I'm sure they are working on Lockbit four already by now. All right, so um, they give I you some pretty, answer. yeah, some it's pretty simple instructions from there. Joel gets in some, some excitement here. Yeah, go ahead, Joel. <laughs> No, I say is the, is the fast and furious of ransomware they reach 10 just now. Yeah, yeah, I you'll you'll see Lockbit in space eventually at some point in time. I mean it, it, it might happen with Starlink, who knows? 
Uh, and Starlink is apparently on its way to us. Um, there's, a, there's a hack for the Starlink servers. The Starlink. Yes, I, I saw the, um, the, the hired the engineer who, um, who hacked them or something as well. So it's inevitable, right? While you hire 10, 10 engineers to secure something, there are like a million developers out there um, working on ways to evade and stuff. So again, ransomware as a service, and you'll realize that some of these are actually pretty recent between 2019 to now, and they've amassed quite the fortune. This one is pretty popular because a lot of infections that I've seen, they do usually have this ABCD virus. So the file extensions in particular, you'll see it as .abcd. Um, so the Lockbit ransomware gang, this is where they, they come across as incredibly deadly because they're already in corporations. And you can go ahead and purchase remote desktop protocol access to these victims. They're already inside your organization. They have already compromised you, but they just sit dormantly waiting for someone to come along and say, well, hey, I want to pay you for this access. All right? And they use vulnerable techniques again, meaning that there's no user interaction or user execution required. They will just deploy and it will automatically propagate. All right? Um, sometimes the deployment is done via phishing attack, so it could be internal, and then it would use things like server messaging blocks, um, PowerShell tools for infection, for the spread, all right? and up to a million dollars in, in ransom. Um, it's actually targeting um, EDR and sandpoint, sand, um, sandbox uh, detection, they, they, mm -hmm. they, and they evade them pretty well. Correct. The evasion techniques being used yeah. now, they are the, on... The new oh. lock, but that is the 3.0. So I expect by the end of this year, we'll probably hear about Lockbit 4.0. And uh, it changes drastically. There are some similarities between them, but you find that I think uh, what I was reading is that a, a lot of the other ransomware gangs, just like we were talking about ransomware affiliates, where you don't know someone is in a ransomware gang, and you may not know because you have no idea who this person is. And then they jump across with a couple other people and say, listen, I have this idea. I don't want to share it with those guys. I want to start something new because we can have all the profits, and all the money, as Joel would say, um, from this type of ransomware out there. So Black Cat as well is one of them that um, is pretty new as well, only about last year. Now, the thing is, it surfaced last year, but that doesn't mean that it was developed last year in 2021. Right, it just surfaced, but from what I've read, um, Alv and Black Cat are the most aggressive, and you can actually find them on this is what I was talking about the ransomware anonymous marketplace or ramp forum, which you can easily get access to on the dark web. Right, and getting on the dark web is not that hard. I really, really do not want you all to go on that dark web. I guarantee you, no matter what protection you have, you will most likely get. Um, hacked or compromised or something like that, right? So please, 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 unless you are a very seasoned researcher or professional, that's the only time I would actually even not even advise you to, right? And I've seen some really disturbing stuff there and I don't really want to go back, all right? But um, interestingly enough, we have this for both Linux and Windows environment on virtualized environments in particular. When you think about it, a lot of high-end systems are virtualized mainly because of cost. Instead of buying 200 servers, you buy some really good robust servers and then run a lot of virtualized servers on them. All right, so virtualization has advantages and disadvantages, right? A hybrid, a mix, prioritization. Oh, it takes, it, it, it isn't just where you have an engineer saying, yes, this works. No, there's a lot of, of planning and a lot of issues that, that have to be worked out, sorted out. A lot of business actually has to go into it, right? But again, we come back to this thing called Cobalt Strike which is a pretty awesome hacking tool. And sometimes it may be used alongside any desk. There's one that I saw recently called Avos Locker, Avos Locker, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but that one in particular takes advantage of any desk. And I'm sure the majority of us here use either any desk or team viewer or something like that, right? Please ensure that the versions that you use or are using, um, they are updated because the slightest slip up could lead to a compromise. Because when you think about it, you know, you, you have access from the outside to the inside. Try and set passwords as well. Don't just allow, you know, random access. Um, there are ways in any desk that you could allow only certain machines for access to this from certain machines as well. 
And like most of the others, and this seems to be common practice now, they do carry out a, a distributed denial of service attack against you if you refuse to pay. And not all of them have pretty interfaces. We have the Ryok ransomware. If we have any anime fans out there, I think this was from um, Death Death Note. He was Ryok was the, the the demon or whatever in the anime. I can't remember. Right, but yeah, plain and simple, network has been penetrated. Do not reset, don't shut down, don't rename, don't, 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 just don't. And um, you'll realize that most of them are similar. So this I was this is what I was talking about with the TTPs, right? The tactics and, and the procedures and stuff. You realize that they are well pretty similar, right? In the way that they would go about attacking stuff, what they would do after. So this is this is what I hope that you all will take away from this to look at certain similarities and put things in place for mitigation. You know, be be as proactive as you can, because I have seen ransomware, um, not necessarily cripple, but but companies have had to build over from scratch sometimes, right? Fortunately, some of these are very large companies that can get this done quite quickly, but um, a lot can't. Right, anywhere from 5.3 million to 12 million, um, it's attributed to the Russian cyber, crime, cyber criminal group, Wizard Spider. Um, and yeah, look, they, they utilize downloads as a service, right? So it usually is true phishing. It usually isn't uh, the infection I'm talking about here is done through a phishing campaign with a download as a service. So for example, if they tell you, click here for some new Windows updates or download the latest stuff or someone tries to launch a phishing campaign against you in some sort of fear and say, I expected this report from you yesterday. You are fired if you don't send it to me. Please edit this report immediately. You download it out of fear, you don't scan it. And then um, for all you know, you've been infected with Emotet and TrickBot Trojans, which would drop them, load them, encrypt them, and then that's some trouble there. Right, we have one called Evil Corp as well, also known as Payload Bin. I think they changed their name because of sanctions or payment sanctions or something like that recently. Right, but Evil Corp has been around for a while with um, Crydex and Drydex um, banking Trojan, right, which was responsible for more than $100 million in theft from various banks and stuff, and was associated with the game over and the Zeus botnet. The botnet is where you have command and control centers out on the internet and they just infect, uh, let's say, 10 machines. And one out of those 10 machines would go ahead on another network and try to infect 10 more and then 10 more and then 10 more. All right? So that's how, that's how the botnets actually operate. Botnets can be up to half a million infected devices all in communication with each other. Right, so um, in 2019, they offered a, a 5 million bounty for information leading to the arrest and conviction of one of them, one of the guys there, Maxim, who was uh, allegedly orchestrating um, operations, <clears throat> right? And they've just rebranded re to, to payload bin to sort of kind of, I guess, disassociate with that, right? So this now is pretty interesting and it is very scary because when we do the demo, we're gonna show you all how easy it is to have access to IoT devices in particular, right? So even if some of your um, web cameras and CCTV cameras, I have actually seen live cameras in, in Trinidad where you see people's living rooms and waiting rooms and gates and stuff like that. And this is not hacking. This is just using one little search engine I'm talking about here, right? So that's just one way that I, I can think about quickly. But um, yeah, it, it, it could be for profit. It could be for internal sabotage, but they, there's usually constant monitoring of a target. You don't just choose this target and say, okay, let's try and attack Apple or something like that today. No. It involves a lot of research. These, they, they always want to be two steps ahead. And of course, in order to do that, you have to be very prepared. And a lot of this activity you can find on the dark web, again, like what I've been saying. So the dark web is full of threats and threat actors, which is why I'm trying to tell you all, please try to stay away from, from the dark web. This is just one example, right? So one of those um, tools is what we call the Shodan browser. You can actually visit it right now. You just go to shodan.io and it comes up as a search engine. And this is it right here, right? So you just have to know the filters for it sometimes, right? And for this one, for example, we just use keywords, um, passwords for IoT devices, Internet of Things devices, even your Android boxes, your Fire Sticks, whatever devices you have out there that can connect to the, in the internet. 
We've even found a lot of um, gas station pumps and boats that are offshore and stuff like that, which we could connect to. Now, of course, connecting to it is actually an offense, but finding this information is not. It's really just a search engine. So um, Martin Roth, you can follow him on Twitter as well. Um, he actually does a lot of work with Shodan. And one of the things that he found was um, some ICS, industrial control system, which is devastating. I'm not sure if you all know about industrial control systems, but think about power plants, nuclear plants, electricity, um, utility companies, uh, manufacturing companies, industrial control systems. These would control all the um, equipment and the operations of, of the plants as well. So operational technology, industrial technology. So imagine that you just have to know what filters to put inside Shodan and you can find stuff like this. It is that easy. All right, for those of you all from uh, the national security training uh, who are logged on, because I'm seeing most a good bit of you all here actually. Um, yeah, you all would have known uh, some of some of these things that, that we went through to see exactly how scary it is because you could find so many different um, types of information. You can even do keywords to search by company. So again, if they have a company in mind, this is just some of the recon that they can actually do. All right, so for OSINT, which is open source intelligence, um, Johnny, you want to take this one? Yeah, I mean, in just exactly what we were saying before, you can use Shodan to map the entire country, which I may have done, probably. I don't think so. Um, yeah, but I mean, just like a short example, you could, these guys will actually map entire countries or regions just by doing, again, as you are saying, the, once you know the search filters, in this case, you know, just do like country TT or country. US, whatever it is, when you do port 445 until the 389, you're going to find all of the eternal blue slash blue keep vulnerable systems on an entire country. And then you go even deeper, you use another IO site. I mean, so many IO sites are ridiculous. You have X, and then you have one called Hunter IO, which is actually pretty cool. I mean, you could sign up for Hunter IO free, I believe, and you'll get. 25 or 30 searches for the month for free. Mm -hmm. But what it is, you're actually putting a company name. So let's just say, I mean, it's already any while Let's just say we use an answer as the example, right? They were hit by Rebel. Um, you know, you just put in whatever their domain is, answer.com or whatever it is. And it will actually go out there and spider the entire internet for whoever, subgot, answer.com, whatever it is. And then you will actually be able to click into those links and then see where those emails actually came up. Um, we we're actually doing our assessments. Well, we go to a go. Um, we actually found it was kind of out of school, but it was kind of interesting as well. Where we found a guy. Um, he's the one of the technical guys for a big energy company, don't believe. Um, we actually were able to stalk him. You know, like we talked about the last. Uh, webinar and he was on an Al Al Teza, Al Teza um, forum and he was talking about things like then you could profile people, use their email addresses and launch specific phishing attacks against them. You know, let's just say that we he was a target in scope. So I said, hey, look, you know, we got some new parts for the Al Teza or whatever it is, right? Just something that piqued his interest, get him to click on a link in work. And there you go. You actually dump some malware behind all the fancy firewalls that Joel was talking about. You know, again, if those are misconfigured, what was the rule again you were saying, Joel? Any, any. So I mean, <laughs> bam, any, any, and then you just internal connection outbound. And then I don't know if you guys actually realized um some of these job postings. Yeah. And even funnily enough, for RFP that we actually got. They give out so much information. It is ridiculous. They would say, hey, you need to be a firewall. It's also blah, blah, blah. You would say, administer Cisco, this series switch. You're just giving away unnecessary information to these guys. And I mean, you put that in conjunction with something like Shodan. Let's just say, you use the proper search filters in Shodan and you cross reference it to a job posting. Before, you didn't know, hey, well, they have some sort of Cisco switch. You look at the job posting on the RFP. We now know it's a 
2960, Joel's favorite switch. <laughs> it's, I mean, it, this is just the tip of the iceberg, but I mean, go as deep as you would learn, you know, using Google Docs. I mean, just, just to jump in a little bit there, Johnny, for, for example, if we go back to Shodan, right? Um, recently, we had um, a couple of breaches with, we always have vulnerabilities in different types of vi uh, firewalls and stuff. And um, what you could do with, with Shodan, actually, now this is the paid version of Sh Shodan. Um, once a year, they usually have a $1 and a $5 sale. I think Black Friday, they usually have a $5 sale. I would advise every single one of you to, to buy the Shodan subscription for Black Friday. You can follow them on Twitter. They post the link on Twitter. Um, because if you have the free account, you have very limited options. But I just have the cheap $5 account. And I can actually search by firewall types throughout a particular country. So I could search by Fortinet, Checkpoint, um, Cisco. And if I do a bit of digging and scanning, I can tell what versions and the firmware. And if I know what firmware you're running and I just throw that inside Google and add the word vulnerability or exploit it, comes back with a million different results on how to go about. So now I can jump on Metasploit or I can jump on Cobalt Strike. And then I already have this information from Shodan, which gives me your IP address. Sometimes they even give you the actual login page because a lot of companies allow, um, for whatever reason, um, log into their firewalls over the internet via, even though they may say HTTPS and stuff, HTTPS doesn't mean that you're secure um, at all, right? Because it really is to just try and brute force. And then on top of that, Trinidad is a very small place and the administrators and security administrators, they are usually known, the managers are usually known by each other. You can try and guess certain things. You can you can do social engineering, which is a non-technical attack to, to meet them. So like, as Johnny was saying, you know, with that that um, technical person who was um, into cars and the, the Alteza and so on, I could do all this information and realize, okay, well, let me just read up on, on um, the Alteza and, and say, okay, well, try and connect to this person on the forum and be like, oh, well, I have this issue with XYZ. What about yours? And hey, thanks so much for the advice. Let me just buy you a beer. What about we, we meet up on our, our Pizza Avenue and you buy a few beers, you get them talking. Oh, well, you know, I'm into IT, not really cars that much. Oh, really? Me too. And it just goes downhill from there. So social engineering together with these OSINT techniques, they are very, very deadly, as deadly as, rans as the ransomware itself sometimes. So, yeah, Johnny, I mean, if you want to add anything else, sorry about that. Yeah, just, uh, I mean, Alex and I actually on an assessment right now, and we did a, I mean, they kind of gave it away, but we exploited it a bit more. <laughs> I mean, pretty much, I can't give it away too much, we got 100% clicks on the email. Mm -hmm. So, just imagine that. This is a big company we're talking about. Yeah, you see phishing, phishing campaigns, uh, approved local phishing campaigns in your company, they should don't be, I mean, if, if not at least twice a year, I recommend it, quarterly at least, right? Alongside things like vulnerability assessments, a pen test could probably be done once a year, depending on the company, but vulnerability assessments, please have these things done regularly because you need baselines, you need to, to build things such as risk registers and all of these things, you need to know what, um, the, the biggest um, reason for doing vulnerability assessments in particular I can think about is so that you can create a security awareness program for your company itself because think about it, right? The, the human element is actually the weakest link next to unpatched systems, I would say, right? But if you can now use a vulnerability assessment, run a, a, a phishing campaign and then say, okay, well, now we know what our users are up to. Let's try and help them protect themselves as well as the, the, the data itself. Right, so in your organizations, try to, if you don't have one, see if you can work with um, the department heads, HR, everyone actually, to come up with some sort of um, cybersecurity awareness program. Like I said, if you all need help from us, we can do a lunchtime talk or something for you all for free. It's absolutely free of charge. Um, this is our way of giving back. Now, this is where it will get very, very interesting because these are actually all my ransomware types that I have downloaded because I take all of them, I infect a test machine, I take that memory dump and I analyze the hell out of them because I, I do this stuff for a living with forensics and pen testing as well. There's red teaming, which is penetration testing and vulnerability assessment. There's blue teaming, which is forensics. And then us guys are on a purple team, which is where you combine the colors, red and blue, you get purple. Right, and purple means that you are skilled in all areas of uh, incident response, forensics, pen testing, uh, 
vulnerability assessments, etc. So these are some of the things. These are mine actually that I have there. I have pretty much all of the different types. Even um this lovely one here. This was insane um, on one of my systems. I don't think I'm even going to bother to use that system anymore. Thankfully, it's a really old set of systems I use for, for testing purposes, right? But this is pretty much all any, this is like your starter kit to get yourself hacked, I should say, because if you decide to go on the dark web, I, I pretty much guarantee you will be hacked, right? Um, there was a video out recently by Heath Adams, as is it Heath Adams? Is Heath Adams, right? Yeah, from the Cyber Mentor. Yeah, he puts out a video. If you look up um, TCM TCM security on YouTube, you'll find him. Great guy. He, he gives away a lot of free resources, and he has, a, I think, a 30-minute video on how to browse the dark web safely, right? And one of the first things that he mentioned it would be these tools, right? You need an operating system called um, Tails, which is a portable operating system. All you need is two gigs of RAM, Windows 7 or later even, and you have a USB drive, uh, a smartphone, something else like that download it you can put the entire operating system on a usb drive plug it into a random machine um, start it up download something called the tor browser the tor browser was supposedly built for anonymity but i think the majority of nodes are with the fbi and nsa so if you use that you're guaranteed to be monitored I do not recommend that you use this stuff but i'm just showing you all how simple it is so imagine your average user goes onto the internet watches a video like that by heath adams for example on how to browse the dark web um safely quote unquote downloads tails puts it on a usb installs um so not installs but runs that um that operating system the tails operating system downloads and installs tor which i don't even think you have to i think it comes with tails right now and that's it you just have to know what sites you would like to go to on the dark web thankfully the sites on the dark web are not xyz.com cfsi.co they are actually so um, just a bunch of characters, but they are interpreted by the Tor browser and the Tor system to get you exactly where you would like to be. Exploitation, we would like to show you all, some of you all who joined our previous um, webinars, um, you all will know about this, but we want to show you all how we can exploit that eternal blue, um, blue keep and a couple others. Maybe we'll do one Windows and one Linux machine, I guess, and show you all how easy it is to exploit outdated systems and unpatched systems to deploy these things right um and sometimes companies may have good excuses for not um updating but it's still an excuse at the end of the day and even though it may be a managed risk it is still a danger to an organization because when you think about it many point of sale systems so when you go to the supermarkets and you cash and so on and they expect you to be able to cash remember recently in the news we had information about um, a supermarket where the point of sale systems weren't working and the card systems or something like that weren't working as well, right? Um, these have operating systems. Even those billboards that you see when you're driving down the highway, they have operating systems. Sometimes if there's a glitch, you might see like Windows XP or Windows 7, ATM machines run older operating systems. If you do not update and patch your systems, you are out in the open, just waiting for something to happen. All right, um, guys, I know you all have a lot to say on this. So, um, Alex, let me, let me hear you on this one. There is no excuse to not protect your systems, period. I, okay. I, I encounter a lot of unpatched systems. I get that organizations are unable to patch everything because some software re are required to run certain levels of applications, particularly in specific industries, including the banking industry, public utilities. I get that. But you can't put protections around it. Mm -hmm. Simple yeah. thing as access rights, making sure that whoever needs access access to it are the only ones that have access to it. Something as simple as that. So there's really no need. There's no reason why you still can't apply some protective layer onto it. Alex, as I have you here one time, just you could probably jump on fishing a little bit. <laughs> yeah, because that fresh in my mind, we executed yeah. some fishing campaigns and. We hit in some executives and the executive was so upset that he was fishing, he forwarded to the IT department and everybody in IT click on the same link. So we had, if we look at it that way, we sent six emails, seven emails. So we had everybody clicking the link. But if you read the details, we had about 32 people clicking the link because it was forwarded to 32 different people. So we had a success rate of more than 100%. We had roughly about 500% success rate. And if you look at it from that perspective, right? So phishing is the attempt 
um, that attackers would use to gain access into the infor- into your network, You're usually targeting some sort of employees, some sort of disgruntled staff. Um, mm-hmm. Some most times it's sending an email that's something related to what the organization does or to what the user may experience. Uh, for example, said same um, um, phishing exercise that we're doing now. My email was all about um, if you're experiencing email issues, please click this link. If you are not experiencing it, so the reverse of it. And yeah, so send so that everyone clicked that link and it was successful. Going to show that, you know, the organization does have some sort of internal email issues. So we just played on that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Right? And that's the reason why victims fall victim to the, that's why the users fall victim to these phishing exercises is that a lot of these phishing emails and, and smishing text messages and and vishing calls kind of the, the intent is to instill some sort of urgency or yeah. fear, anything like that that will drive a person to, you know, investigate and click on something and show some sort of curiosity into that, right? And like Shiva said before, the Stanford University said that, you know, what they expect that one out of 10 people are guaranteed, guaranteed to click a phishing link. And that's the reason why spam still exists. Spam is a still a billion dollar industry. Yeah. It costs maybe a thousand US to send roughly 10 million emails. Just think about that. Just think about it. If one in every 10 clicks, yeah, that's 1 million people clicking that link. And if, it, if you charge $1 per click, you made a million dollars. You just spent $10,000 <laughs> and made a million dollars. That's how easy it is these days. This, this, this is not a business opportunity, by the way. <laughs> just, just give me the stats. Just give me the stats. And right, the that's how easy it is. Yeah, and, and just like, like doing your homework. Yeah, and just like Shiva said, with the ransomware as a service, there is spam as a service. Just turn that out there, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so I think, um, some key things. Mail, Mailchimp was was compromised recently, or something like that. Mailchimp was compromised recently because yeah. um. Somebody actually, who it is, I can't remember who it was, actually put out a, a notice that, hey, we use MailChimp and you may have been compromised. Yeah. Just to throw that out there. So <clears throat> just some indicators that you as users can look for to try and, you know, mitigate, try and minimize you becoming a victim of phishing. And the key thing is ensuring that the link you're getting the email from is a legitimate link, right? If the email is supposed to come from yourbank.com, Make sure it's not coming from your dash bank.com. It's literally that simple, right? Ensure that, I mean, in some cases, a lot of common sense where um, you know very well you don't have a relative living in Kenya. Why are you going to click a link to get you money from Kenya? Something as simple as that, checking for spelling errors. Um, Everyone's, everyone gets that email from Netflix at some point in time stating, I know the, the payment didn't go through. Even very well know that you did pay the bill already. Simple things like that. You don't want to, and if anything should require certain information that doesn't make sense to you, then don't give the information. A little, mm-hmm. Sometimes the intuition is one of the best things. Perfect example, I refuse to install the Republic Bank mobile app on my phone. I refuse to do it. Why in Jesus' name would you require access to my camera and my microphone to perform banking operations and contacts? Why would you need access to it as a bank? You don't need it. Yeah. So if your mind tells you something is wrong with this, most times something is really wrong with it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you see this banner, please? I know everyone is, is just oblivious to this banner in your emails, especially for work emails. But please understand that it is actually telling you that it's coming from an external party. I know it may be annoying to click on an email address to actually view the whole email address, but it's mm-hmm. just to protect yourself, right? We just It is just a best practice to protect yourself, and that is it. Um, guys, I know we're running close to half eight, but we're almost done, right? We just have about five <laughs> or six more slides again. Um, it, it was a lot, but... Uh, um, these these sites that I have here, these sites are pretty good. This one, ransomware infection notifications, you have all of the screenshots and the text files that you would usually find associated with almost all types of ransomware, similar types of ransomware. So I've included these links. Like I said, if you just look at the handout section of the GoToWebinar um, app, you should see it inside of there for download. If not, just send me an email. I'll leave the email address up. I promise not to hack you. 
um, I promise these guys will not catch you as well, right? But I'll just, um, I'll probably upload this to Dropbox or something and just send you a link. And also I'll put it up on LinkedIn and um, the webinars and stuff. So just a little bit of advice from me in particular, right? If you, you have um, realized that there is infection, right? You realize at this point, all right, this is it. It's hit the fan, something is going on, right? Notify your supervisor, contact your IT manager. You all should have a blue team framework a blue team framework means that in, in terms of incident response, you have a set standard that you would follow. You, you know, just like um, if there's a fire, every organization, you would have a fire marshal, you, you know proper procedures, you know not, maybe not to use the elevator, try and use the stairwell, take certain um, precautions, etc. That's That's what the blue team framework is about. You don't have to make one there. There's so many that you could download and choose one and just apply it. Right, immediately try and disconnect from your network. I would suggest you do not switch off your machine because if you switch off your machine and put it back on, chances are, like I said before, whatever was, was stored in your memory, it will be wiped. And if you call someone like me to help you out, it, it, it just creates a bunch of uh, unnecessary stress. But then again, I mean, realizing you know the infection itself could be a scary thing. Some people may not know how to react. Again, this is where security awareness training has to come into play. Just like how you have proper procedures for, for the fire drills and so on, same thing could be applied. I would suggest only having forensic analysts or very qualified professional have them handle the device, perform RAM and disk acquisition. I want to do all of this with you all in the next, um, the next webinar. We're going to show you how to do RAM acquisition, disk acquisition, um, ransomware artifact analysis. We look at um, WannaCry, for example, because that's pretty popular. Um, network traffic, how to analyze network traffic, how to view malware network traffic. And please contact either the cybercrime units in Trinidad and Tobago. We have the, um, the C-suits of Trinidad and Tobago. They are very helpful. I think that's Angus and um, Anish and those guys, if I'm not mistaken. All right. Um, they will try to actually help you out as best as they can and follow up with you. Um, you should also allow a professional to analyze the acquired forensic images. If any of you all have forensic Im images that you've acquired and you want to just want to share it with me to upload and have me take a look at it, that's not a problem. I, I don't mind um, having a look, right? You can also go to sites like these from Kaspersky. Well, Kaspersky has a little bit of trouble these days because it's a Russian company, but um, they do have some pretty good free ransomware decryptors. And like I said, though, if you are downloading ransomware decryptors, be very careful because the majority of them from random websites, they contain ransomware. So you have a double infection or triple infection as the case may be. And from here on, this is just a sneak peek of what we want to do with you all for the other webinar um, for ransomware, ransomware artifact, ransomware artifact analysis. I don't know what I'll call it yet. Right, but um, yeah, this is the, the simplest tool that I can tell you all to use for capturing your memory. It's a really lovely free tool called Belkasoft Live RAM Capturer. It's a tiny, tiny program that you install and it asks you what you would like to capture, the physical memory, the virtual memory. It saves it as a file, that's that. <clears throat> this is what I use in volatility. Volatil I love, I absolutely love this tool. I'm, I am a, unfortunately obsessed with it, but it gives me a breakdown of exactly what I can find, what processes are running. Look, even down here, it actually shows one one decryptor, which is a version of WannaCry, and it says here, for example, the the process ID and the parent process ID. They are linked to certain numbers here, 740. These dots indicate to me that one one decryptor and the WannaCry, they were spawned from Explorer.exe. They went um, then task scheduler, then under task scheduler. You have you have this process. So using volatility, for example, I can see all the connections that took place. I can see all the users logged on, um, processes that were running, malware that may have been running. Volatility is an incredibly awesome tool. And it's not that hard to use. You don't have to be a professional forensic investigator like I am. So I'll actually show you all how to do this in a tutorial. Actually, I think I'll do that. I think I'll actually put together a manual for you all for the next webinar. And here I go again, being quite overly ambitious, but I'll try. <laughs> I've been you, could also, you could also get the book Digital Forensics by Shiva Parashram. Yeah, we, we, we wrote books on <laughs> Digital yeah, Forensics. Yeah, chapter on volatility. Which has all of this stuff. Um, Wireshark is a great free tool that you can use for network analysis and stuff like that. And I, I'm seeing that you all have questions in the chat, so we will get to those questions, I promise. Um, if you're willing to, to bear with us for a few more minutes. Wireshark is free to download, but 
what anyone can do actually is capture even on your home network. I would not advise you to do this on your, your work network without permission, right? Because it runs in something called promiscuous mode that could set off a little bit of alerts and get you in trouble depending on policy. Um, but at home, you can definitely install Wireshark and just capture some, some regular traffic and then try and analyze that traffic. I don't recommend that beginners try to analyze it in Wireshark, which is why I would recommend a tool such as Network Miner and it's free. So when you capture your network data with Wireshark, for example, you can install Network Miner. There's Network Miner for Windows, Linux, Mac, everything. And this is what it does. It actually just analyzes everything for you and breaks it down quite nicely. It tells you what devices it found, what operating systems were running, what files were transmitted. Um, as you can see, there's some stuff about emails, sessions, credentials even as well. I love Network Miner. Um, it's, it, there's a free version, there's a commercial, the commercial version, I think is a thousand US, but in my opinion, it is actually worth it. Um, there's also an online analysis tool. I love this site, packettotal.com. You can upload a, 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 a packet capture file that you created with Wireshark and upload it. And what it will do is analyze everything for you and tell you what is malicious, what is suspicious, where it came from, where it was going to, a description of it, the time, the ports, everything used. So these are things that any administrator and technical person should be doing on a regular basis, even at random times. I do it for clients as well. Jump on their networks, take a little bit of um, sample this and that. So I add to the baseline and, and we add to the documentation. We look at what's happening, where it's taking place, where it's contacting, from what IP addresses locally, right? But something I want all of you all to do, if not tonight, by tomorrow, check, please check and see if your email addresses are compromised. Right, so you have sites. The the one I use in particular is just Have I Been Pwned. I think all of us use this. Even when I'm <clears throat> doing assessments for clients, I usually ask them to provide a list of email addresses, and I try to enter at least management and I mean everyone if if I have the time, right? But what this will do is tell you if not necessarily if someone got your password, but if your email address at least sometimes your password you never know was released in a breach list. So you have very large data breaches taking place. And for example, the, the same way that Cisco found out that it was it was pwned, as we say, or hacked or breached, was that um, one of the groups decided to release their information on a data leak site, a, a leak site in particular, as we call it. So some people have gotten phishing emails saying that um, your email address is this. Your password for at one point in time was X, Y, Z or half the password. And it scares you because they may say something like, we have footage of you nude in front of your webcam or I don't know, whatever things like they does on a Friday night maybe. And um, uh, we're gonna blackmail you and send this to all your contacts and your, your, your work contacts in particular, right? So have I been pwned would actually let you know if your email address was breached or in a breach at any point in time. So particularly your personal email addresses, which I realize that the majority of people do not change their passwords for, please check up on your personal email addresses inside of your companies. I mean, we usually, hopefully, have a policy that allows you to, um, you know, to go ahead and change that every three months, All right? So we're almost at the end. This is the last, it's, it's just two more slides, right? We want to talk about mitigation and preventative tips to ensure business continuity. What I've done is put together this list based on the recommendations by the FBI and CISA for all of those types of ransomware attacks. Remember I said, when we look at the IOCs and the TTPs in particular, they are all quite similar. So therefore, I mean, it goes without saying that um, mitigation and preventative measures should be you know, similar. Of course, you can't protect 100%. Any company that offers you 100% protection, they really just are interested in your money. And that is that because I guarantee you the minute you lapse in your subscription towards that company, you're going to end up on your own, which I'm actually seeing happen right now with a very large company and I don't like it at all, but it's either them, they either pay for it or not. So your backups in particular, please make sure that your backups are sanitized, kept offline and offsite. As these guys were telling us, you know, cold storage, as Dave in particular was mentioning, cold storage is very important. Um, I think Simon was mentioning it in the chat as well about a hybrid IT environment, right? You have to know what's important to you and um, in terms of disaster recovery and, and uptime, downtime, restoration time, all of these things. It's a very tedious exercise, but this is where security and business personnel have to meet and bridge that gap between technical 
and the business side of it, right? If you could, and if you have the resources, if it's not too strenuous on your network, you can encrypt um, your network traffic, whether it's data at rest or data at transit, right? So hopefully just deter, maybe prevent unauthorized leakage and exfiltration, because if exfiltration begins, your data is encrypted. So it should be a pain for them to decrypt. Or if you are willing to say, well, that's fine, it's it's encrypted. You, you, can, you can exfiltrate as you like, right? We have many security standards. I would suggest reading up on some NIST standards. Um, Alex, Johnny, Dale, Joel, any NIST standards in particular you'll recommend that, that they could probably follow? 853 is pretty much standard, right? Yeah. So you can search for NIST, N-I-S-T, 800-53, um, a little bit R2. lengthy, but we have summarized documents as well. Um, you can also look up the CIS controls. CIS as in the Center for in Internet the Control. I, yeah, I can't remember it. Something <laughs> like that. Center for Internet Security Controls. Um, I think they have an updated version about 20 controls that are best practices that you should have in place. Please update everything. If you can, you should. Right, so the firewalls, the routers, the switches, the Wi-Fi access points. Contact your ISP and ask them about firmware on the modems as well. All of these things, your printers, your scanners, your multifunction machines. I have found botnets inside a very large organization where the multifunction printer, scanner, copier, the huge ones um, uh, that usually lease, they were um, compromised and the company lost its scan to email function. They were blacklisted. They had to go to spam house and beg and pay for their, their IP address to, to um, be valid again. Um, so these things can happen. Whatever whatever exists that can connect, you need to ensure that it is patched. Look at segmentation, or, you know, divide your networks accordingly. Um, practice the, the, what do you call it? The least privilege practice, right? If you don't, if people don't need access, please don't give them access. If they require access, have a policy, have a form, let them formally um, apply for it and explain, you know, and maybe speak with the managers, etc. cetera. Um, please renew your firewall subscriptions on time. I'm dealing with a company right now that has lapsed maybe two months so far. And I think every day when I check it, I'm seeing something like 200,000 um, connections or something like that. All right, so please renew your subscriptions in a timely fashion. I know sometimes, finances are issues, but it has to be done, especially if you want an online presence and you have data to protect. Disable those services, remote desktop protocol, telnet, SSH, if not needed, disable SMB version one and firewall systems, because that is where you will find the eternal blue um, vulnerabilities, which could be exploited and ransomware will easily slip into your network. Test your network performance, do vulnerability assessments, do pen tests, right? And I put a pretty good link there. Um, I, have which, a, I, have a, I have a hard link, yeah, guys, got in the chat. Uh, you have a? I have a hardening guide as well. A link to the hardening guide in the chat. So that's good, Johnny can use that. <laughs> All right, so the FBI has suggested these tips as well to review your domain controllers, your servers, workstations, antivirus logs in particular, because a lot of these types of ransomware, they will go in and see all of your processes and disable some of them. Some of them may include um, your, your host-based antivirus, your host-based firewalls. Like I said, implement network segmentation. Have a plan. Download one of those frameworks and those documents and have an incident response plan as well. No matter if you're up in the cloud or hosting locally, it, it really doesn't matter. Use multi-factor authentication. Please secure yourself. Do not connect to those hotspots and those flow, Digicel, Amplia, whatever. It doesn't matter. at and anywhere you go, Starbucks. I, I don't care. I don't want to hear it. We can do a lot of damage there on, on um, personal networks. I will show you all again some stuff that we use like portable hacking kits. I have a watch that I can wear to attack Wi-Fi and bring on bring off Wi-Fi. I have something called a, a Raspberry, um, sorry, a Raspberry Pi, which is a computer running Kali Linux. There's all the hacking tools in the world that I need. I have the Wi-Fi Pineapple. Thank you very much, Christian. By the way, you give that to me as a gift. Um, that I can create a rogue access point, and I could, I could. These things are very tiny. I can, they can fit in the palm of my hand. I have a phone with Kali Linux on it. I'll be using my phone in Starbucks and you'll think I'll just be chatting on WhatsApp or something, but I could be hacking the hell 
out of your network. Not that I will, because I don't do those things, right? That's just, you know, uh, yeah, disclaimer right there. None of us do those things, actually. <clears throat> right? Um, and if you have the option to disable hyperlinks received in emails, the guys, you all, I'm sure, have some additional tips uh, that you all could think about at the tip of your tongue. Anything? Don't give out too much information. Yeah. <laughs> Biggest one, do not give out uh, too much information, right? You, you might be trying to be helpful and stuff, but please understand that the more information you give out is the more that someone or some party out there can use against you, right? So the FBI alerts I was talking about and the CISA alerts, um, you can find most of them here at the CISA link and the FBI link and so, well, both of them are actually right there. They give you nice two or three page documents that you can view and um, even for every different type of ransomware, you have those documents. So if you sort of combine and correlate all the mitigation and then put that forth as things that have to be done to protect your environment and yourselves, you should be in a better place and have an improved security posture, as I'd like to say. Um, let's go to the questions. Wow, you guys were busy. Answer uh, pretty let's... much between John, between Joel and myself. Okay. We answered the majority of them. At least yeah, the large ones. Firewall mitigate this movement, such as ubiquity of PFSense. Yeah, ubiquity and PFSense could be used. PFSense is actually pretty good if you configure it um, properly. Uh, um, Kumar was asking, would you advise doing a master's in cybersecurity or suits? Honestly, it's up to you, sir, because I know gentlemen that have no masters, they maybe have one or two suits and they are the best at what they do. Um, suits and masters and stuff are good for jobs and consultancy, but that doesn't mean that you know anything, right? Um, we try to fix that at CFSI. For some of, for yeah. most of you all who did the Certified Ethical Hacker with us, you realize that we focus a lot on practical, right? Not just on getting the certification, but we want you to actually be able to do what we can do and go and make something of yourselves, be able to do this on your own, et cetera. Right. If you need advice as well on what suits to do and, and whatnot, please just um, uh, you can reach out to me at 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 any point in time. Uh, you can add me on LinkedIn as well. Just search for my name, Shiva Parashram, on LinkedIn, and um, you'll find me there. I'll add me. It's fine. Simon was saying that some grocery stores in Trinidad, uh, their point of sale system still have Windows Seven. That is very true, Simon. I know the majority of. All right, I don't have the majority of them, but a lot of <laughs> of the common ones. They do have Windows 7 as their point of sale systems. Some run on Windows XP. Yeah. Some some bank ATMs are Windows yeah. XP and Windows Yeah. Uh guess I need to drop. All right, cool. No problem, Joe. You go ahead. We 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 pretty much done. Uh some manufacturers machinery. Mm -hmm. Windows XP and Windows 7. Um any mentorships, associate programs for cybersecurity? Pretty much, this is it as far as we know. We don't have too many cybersecurity mentorships. We just try to educate and maybe give you all a little bit of a certificate at the end. But like I said, please feel free to reach out to us at any point in time. We'll help you out. A higher national diploma is recognized in the field of cybersecurity. Um, locally, maybe. Um, internationally, it's best you try some of those certs like you have the Certified Ethical Hacker, you have the OSCP the practical network pen testing, even the CompTIA pen test plus and all of these things. But yeah, certifications, yeah, they, they don't prove that you know anything. You have a lot of work, a lot of lab time to do. How we got to the stage is that we've set up our own labs virtually and just hack the hell out of things and do incident response and stuff. So before I go, guys, you all have anything you want to leave them with, some parting words of wisdom or anything like that? Mm -hmm. Go be British. <laughs> Don't be British. Deal that gang uh, 2020. I, I hope he takes his own advice. And... <laughs> All right, now these, these, these boys are brilliant. Guys, thank you so much again for your time. This was this is actually a great way to celebrate the, the first anniversary of CFSI Cyberfence. Folks, thank you all out there. I know a lot, a lot of people had to leave because of the time. We still yeah. have 100 people here. So thank you all so very much. We, before oh, we jump um, over, we just have we just had two questions that just came in. Sure. RDP recommended to be disabled in most cases. What alternatives uh, do you recommend for remote access? A VPN with RDP would be the best bet. Yeah. yeah. Secure VPN. Or, jumps, yeah. or jump server mm -hmm. through VPN. 
That'd be your best bet right there. Um, part of the and part of having a spam filter, what else do you have to prevent emails spoofing from an internal IP? Uh, access control list, a whitelist or a blacklist for emails. That's pretty much it. That's the best bet, yeah. best practice from that standpoint. And that's it. Yeah, that's it. All right. So one more time, guys. If you didn't um download the handout, all the slides are available there. All the links are inside of there. I will have this webinar posted. Um, within a week, timestamps and everything, just head over to the YouTube channel, hit subscribe, and you should get a notification when it's out. Everything will be timestamped. I'll break it down into individual sections, which takes me a good while to do. All right. right. That's um, check your spam folder by tomorrow for the certificate of attendance. Um, reach out to us, right? You have my email there. You have the website. You have LinkedIn. Um, that's the company. Uh, page on LinkedIn. You can follow that. We're on Instagram and YouTube. Unfortunately, I am going to create a TikTok account for PFSI and post little tidbits from here and there because apparently TikTok is the new thing with these these kids. It's a hipster these thing to do. Like the hipster thing. Can oh, I just do yeah. YouTube short or Instagram real? Well, according to Gary Vanya Chuck, um, you need to do all of them. But I, I think, yeah, I will be doing a lot of uh, Instagram reels on these same things. I'll actually chop up some of these and put them out as YouTube reels and Instagram reels. And I don't know, maybe I'll tell Savvy is the TikTok queen. I'll probably tell her to go ahead and um, handle that for us. Yeah, nice guys, one, TikTok. So Sorry. Thanks so very much for joining us today. I know it was a pretty long session. Um, nobody? Okay. So <clears throat> thank you very much guys for joining us. Just, just leave it I, in there. I hope I, I I'm hoping by let me just check the date. Uh okay, so today is the 18th. I'm thinking about the first week in September to have the follow-up to this. So maybe the first of September, if if everyone is um available, we'll try and do the follow-up to this, which is where we'll do the practical aspect and show you all how to do some of the stuff that we're talking about um in a safe environment. So what I will probably do is send out um, a guide so that in the registration form for the next one, I'll send out something about how to set up a secure um, virtual environment if you have the RAM to spare, etc. So you can build this and try out this your, your own stuff um, in a safe environment. Uh, you know, and don't try not to go any dark web, please. I really discourage it. All right. Oh. So hopefully <clears throat> we'll see you guys on the first of September. So. From all of us here at CFSI, including uh, Joe, Joel, who had to run, um, thanks very much for joining us. Um, uh, if you can't be safe, be good. And as Alex would say, we're here for a good time, not a long time, right? So um, on that note, we'll end. And please feel free to reach out to us. And we'll see you all soon. All right? So you all take care. Bye. Cheers. Cheers. Table. Yeah. <clears throat>